time, so I'd like to get started. And uh, just if you would call the roll. Commissioner Chavanda. Present. Commissioner Del Rosario. Present. Commissioner Chomsky. Present. Commissioner McCroskey. Still here. And Commissioner Reeves is absent. Right. So uh, tonight, uh, I plan to start uh, the meeting by recognizing uh, a local individual, but I'd also like to recognize the 32 year anniversary of the couple in the front here. No, you're not couple. Oh, I'm sorry. You're not our way. I'm misunderstood. I'm terrible. So congratulations on your and your husband's 32nd anniversary. And it's on film tonight, so you'll know nothing happened. In, in more somber news, um, recently, uh, a man named uh, Tom Clark, who's a poet uh, of some renown, uh, a 77 year old man, was uh, killed as a pedestrian on the streets of Berkeley near the top of Marin, the Alameda, one evening on uh, August 18th. And I'd like to open the meeting in honor of him and his work and uh, in honor of the pedestrians and their safety ever. So from that somber note, we move on to the rather housekeeping role of approving our minutes from July 26th. I'll move to approve. A second. Do we have any discussion or comments on the minutes? Actually, I have one. I have a question. Um, first of all, I want to say uh, the minutes are, there's a lot of information in the minutes. I want to thank you, Justin, because I'm assuming those are coming from you. And that's your hard work. Thank you. Um, there was one item. Uh, you're not taking credit? We have some yes, outside assistance. Oh, you do? Okay. But, I, right. but you're probably proofing it. And we appreciate that. Um, Item number 62 was about the uh, intersection of uh, Brighton and San Gabriel. And uh, at the end, it just said um, Jeff Bond will take these comments into consideration. Did we talk about what the next step or when we might see that back might be? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not recalling the end of that agenda item. We could go back and double check with the tape. Um, and clarify that in the final minutes if you'd like us to. That'd be great. Thank you. With that, barring further discussion, all in favor? So, wait, are we approving these as the final minutes, or are we oh, make, adjusting the motion to approve with that modification, or? Well, we don't have the information right now. Right, we don't know if, if a modification is called for or not. Um, do you want to postpone approving them altogether? Do you want to ask to approve with with the possible modification? How about this? Since the minutes are no longer sequestered as drafts, they're now part of the agenda and are available to the public. We're not uh, delaying the release. So why don't we table the minutes until that one issue has been resolved and revisit them next time? Okay. Sure. Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll table that out and move on. So our next item is public comment, and uh, I want to make it clear that this is the uh, the public comment for some things that are or anything in fact that's not on the agenda otherwise tonight. Uh, and in general, our public comment is three minutes a person. And um, slightly new to to this. Uh, body is that uh, standard uh, agendas are requiring no comments on future agenda items. So if you have a future agenda item that you'd like to propose, this public comment period is your time to do so. We also ask that for our records and our beautiful minutes, that you fill out a comment card from the back and hand that in so we get your name correct. Is there anybody who wishes to speak with the general public comment? Please step up. Hi, I just have a couple comments. One is. Um, and can you share your name with us for the record? Um, I can, uh, but I don't think I have to. It's your choice. All right, good. 
I think I looked it up. Um, I have two comments. One is about the, I've brought this up before, but I, I, I'll just keep bringing it up until I don't know what happens next, but the Hawk signal, which I know is sort of on the agenda tonight because it's sort of part of something else, but it's not the one I'm talking about. It's part of the proposal for Washington, I think. But um, I don't know if, I, I think there's been some conversation about this and I got some responses, but I just want to keep bringing up that how dangerous I think that signal is, the one that's near that store. Um, Yes, yes, the one at Dartmouth and St. Pelo. Yes, and I've spent a lot of time there timing things, watching cars, watching cars, not sure what to do. And my suggestion is to, instead of having the blinking red, is to have a solid red. That's my suggestion, because people know what a solid red is. They actually know what a blinking red is, which is the same as the stop sign for them. And since they don't stop at stop signs, they don't always stop at blinking red lights. So I would really, I think it's just an accident waiting to happen. I, I've watched it many times and I just think it's really dangerous. People are really confused. Maybe if we had no traffic coming from anywhere else over a period of many, maybe many years, people would figure out what it is. But we have people coming from all over and they stop, they start, they wait till the pedestrians across the street or they don't wait till the pedestrians across the street or they stop at the blinking red light and go even though there is a pedestrian in the crosswalk. They do every possible permutation of what you could do and I just think it's really dangerous. Um, and then my other comment is just um, something else I've brought up and I, I don't know what the answer is and you and I can, can talk more about this but I'm really horrified by the fact that Probably 99.5% of the people that drive through Albany don't stop at any of the stop signs. They don't even pause a lot of times now. It's gotten to the point where they just drive through. And it's just so dangerous and so scary to be a pedestrian. And I worry all the time about people who don't understand that the car's not going to stop and don't think to hesitate. Now I wait. I wait to see. I've had cars drive around me while I'm in the, the, in the crosswalk, you know, I, literally in the middle of the car, crosswalk. Somebody drives through a stop sign and then swerves so they don't have to stop. I've had that happen to me several times. It's just a really dangerous situation and we need to change what we're doing in our city. And I used to think it was up to the police officers, but I guess there just aren't enough police officers to be at every stop sign, so there needs to be something else done. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Amy Smolens. I wasn't going to speak, but since Julie mentioned the hawk signal, I had the occasion to be there and use that today as I was walking to Belmont Village. And um, I had no problem crossing because I'm from New York, and so I just do stuff like wave at the cars and say stop and everything. Um, but one thing that happened is someone that was crossing from the other side, from the east side, from Belmont Village, um, pressed the button and then walked across the bike path and had to avoid, the cyclist had to stop to not hit a pedestrian because the signal, the signal button is on the other side. And so that just doesn't make any sense. And I don't know, I mean, I know, I don't know why it's there, but it would be nice if somehow that would be able to be changed because that's just definitely an accident, a smaller accident than getting hit by a car, but an accident waiting to happen nonetheless. Um, also, second subject, I live on Keynes Avenue and I know that it was about a year ago that you guys were considering the Keynes and Adams um, bike boulevard projects and then it got approved um, for a pilot project in December by city council and some of my neighbors are going, hey, when's that gonna happen? And so I just would like everyone's sort of waiting for it to happen and hoping it can happen soon and people are still riding in the quote wrong direction anyway so it would be nice if it were marked correctly so people can use it um, as it will be intended. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, we'll move along. One Ken, comment is, that was at the city council meeting that we wanted to pass along to traffic and safety was a comment regarding, this was at the September 17th council meeting, stop sign bars along key route um, are inconsistent that at Brighton you have to have a second stop as you're making a left turn. 
um, from Key Route onto Brighton or from Brighton onto Key Route, and that the other intersections along Masonic don't have that. So passing that comment along. Key Route. The other intersections along Key Route. Ken, did, did you want to see if staff has any responses to the general public comments, or is there nothing that, that warrants staff comment there? Um, uh, staff, did you have any responses? Uh, there was a question about the pilot. Uh, you might have information on that? We are planning to bring that back to you at, at one of the at your upcoming meetings. Our consultant, um, who happens to be here this evening on, on one of your other agenda items, has, has been working on it. And Great. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to go to the announcements section, which is now closer to the beginning of the meeting. We're going to start with a report on the Caltrans installation of new crosswalk sign striping and signage on San Pablo Avenue. Yes, yeah, so we learned a little belatedly, but Folks have probably seen some changes out on San Pablo as we discuss some treatments tonight. Um, Caltrans has been working across several cities on more immediate pedestrian safety improvements at non-signalized intersections. And there are four locations in Albany that they are doing enhanced wet and nighttime crosswalk treatments. Um, signs went up earlier, in, I believe, in July, so advanced warning signs of the crossing point. Um, they just did some curb treatments, red curb in advance of the crosswalks earlier this week, and any evening now should be doing uh, new higher visibility crosswalks at those four unsignalized crossing points in Albany. Great. And then the item 4-2 was, um, we received notification that MTC is funding a study that was a proposal by the West Contra Costa County Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, Caltrans previously, through an I-80 I corridor project, evaluated signal timing up and down San Pablo Avenue that focused on weekdays. It did not deal with weekend signal timing. So this project will be looking up in Contra Costa County, but is now going to be extended through Albany. Um, to look at the signal timings at the signalized intersections through Albany uh, for weekend times. So this is a request for a louder volume. Sure. I'll speak closer to the microphone. So the timeline on that um, is they're going to look at existing conditions through October, provide initial recommendations around the end of the year, and they're looking at April or May 2019 implementation. So as I receive more information, I'll bring the, them here, that here. So for item 4-1, are, are the treatments that Caltrans is doing informed by the plans that we've made for improving those intersections as part of complete streets, or is that a separate project? It's a separate project. They're using the city standard, which is what shown in our previous designs for continental pattern versus the two little bars that currently are in the ground. Um, but it's just the, the striping that they're doing. And for 4-2, um, is it simply just a signal, signal retiming project, or is there some sort of capital upgrade signal component to that? Just timing. Just timing. It's a long time. All right, any other questions? Am I taking public comment on announcements? I don't see why not. Is anybody interested in commenting on the announcements that were just made in section four? Please come up. I need you to come to the microphone. Thank you. What, what are the four intersections? The unsignalized intersections are the southern approach of Washington and San Pablo. Um, they are at Garfield, at Portland, and Clay. Thanks. Anyone else? 
Okay. Um, that's going to move us on to item 5.1, the mo monthly police data on collisions and citations. And I want to thank uh, staff for um, uh, putting the information up ahead of time so we could take a look at it. Thank you. With uh, August break, there's two months worth of new data. Um, total collisions are si were 16 in the month of July and 15. Oh, sorry, Pedest I'm showing pedestrian. So pedestrian collisions were one collision in the month of July and none in August. Bicycling auto collisions were two in the month of July and zero in August. The total vehicle collisions were 16 in July and 15 in August. And injury collisions were seven in July and zero in August. Citations in July were 78 citations that were issued, 74 in August, and DUI arrests, three and six. Um, the people may be aware in July there was a rather serious hit and run um, collision along Marin that involved two separate, two of the collisions reported here were from the same overall incident. There was a collision on San Pablo and Marin that continued on and then had another collision over at Masonic and Marin. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Also was included in the packet um, some traffic safety handouts. I included several of them that I think were most relevant, but there are additional um, traffic safety information handouts available on the website listed there. They were provided by the, the chair. I'll note, since it's come up at this meeting, there is state and federal data in those. It is 2012 to 2016. It doesn't overlap a whole lot with the, the data we have here that we're presenting, but it gives a sense of trend over those years. Yeah, I thought they were just illustrative of other trends that were going on nationwide and give us a chance to see some other windows of data. Okay. Um, I'm sorry to have to ask this in the middle of the meeting. Um, I have a new computer. What's the Wi-Fi password? <laughs> All lowercase. I thought I had tried that, but um, yeah, I'm. I'm. Don't think I'm getting through. I'll have to deal without it. Um, thank you. So we've come to item number uh, six one under our discussion and action items. This is a design alternatives for San Pablo Avenue and Washington Avenue and uh, specifically looks at pedestrian bicycle improvements in this area. We've looked at this before, we'd like to look at it again, and I'll turn it over to staff to introduce. Yes, thank you. Um, what we'd like to do this evening is give you um, an opportunity to give direction to a recommendation to the city council on a specific element of the project. Um, just to, to give you a recap, um, the, um, uh, the, the the overall project involves the, a series of pedestrian improvements along San Pablo Avenue and Buchanan Street and uh, realignment of intersection at um, Madison and Buchanan and, and a few other elements. One of the elements that uh, we want to revisit again is the intersections of San Pablo and Washington to um, gather additional public comment that you'll hear this evening and introduce, provide you with an, a new alternative that might address some of the issues that you'll hear about. Um, to, what I'd like to do is rather quickly go through a um, brief PowerPoint presentation. Andrew Lee with Parisius uh, Transportation is here and can explain in more detail uh, the, the third alternative that we are introducing for consideration and, and, and perhaps help, help with some of the other questions. Andrew is part of the team that's led by BKF engineers who are doing the design work. 
Um, just so that you um, know that we have it here, if it's helpful for the discussion to get people oriented, we're talking about the intersections of Washington and San Pablo. There are two different intersections and um, have a few different street views. This is from the north looking towards the south. This is from the south looking north. And then this is across the street in both directions. This is looking towards the west and this is looking towards the east. Um, again, this is just so later on if you if you want to bring these in, we'd find it helpful to have these images up we've got in the PowerPoint. Um, just a little bit of context. This is something that we've been working on at kind of a high planning level for a number of years. Uh, we've had in the active transportation plan, the city's general plan, Washington Avenue as a bicycle boulevard for a while, uh, for a number of years. Um, and in addition, in the 2012-2013 timeframe, we did a complete streets planning study for the entire corridor that also identified um, some improvements to this particular intersection. Um, the planning study at that time had a different solution than what you've looked at, and you, although you looked at this, um, what the direction that we've been going in the recent design. Um, this is, um, and I'll show you that in a second. This is from our active transportation plan, and the, the intersections that we're talking about are right here, and this shows the, the bicycle route. This is um, the only bicycle crossing, uh, designated bicycle route across San Pablo, north of Solano Avenue. Uh, so it's an important crossing. Um, this is another graphic from the active transportation plan, the purple line indicates the um, desired slow routes um, that would be a little bit more comfortable for, for many bicyclists. And again, the intersections that we're talking about are right there. Um, and this is essentially the same image from the city's general plan blown up a little bit. And um, the general plan, the idea of a, of a second signal is actually identified here um, uh, by the, the signal with the blue box indicating a new signal. Um, and then last, as I mentioned, this is an image of the, at the planning level, the, the idea that was presented as part of the complete street plan was to have a bicycle lane in the median um, in the early in the design process for the, the project that we're, that we're working on now. I think the conclusion was, the commission was that this didn't feel like it would be um, a safe, the, the details wouldn't really make a, for a comfortable and safe crossing and that we wanted to explore other ways to get people um, across the street comfortably on bicycles. Um, so uh, to recap the design process that we're currently in, um, first of all, the, program, the project is being funded by an active transportation grant that we received in 2015. Um, there have been a series of different types of meetings. We had a technical review committee meeting in September of 2017 that discussed this, this area. Traffic and Safety Commission had a couple of different discussions about this last year. Um, and in recognition that, that this was going to impact some very specific businesses um, and, and that we hadn't heard from them, Justin and I did some targeted outreach uh, to the businesses that would be right in front of the, the, the cycle track that, is, that had come out of the planning process this far. Um, and so they'll, they're here this evening to express um, some of their concerns and some of their ideas as well. Um, in addition, so that you know, we have presented the plans at a um, uh, essentially a 65% level to Caltrans. This was one of the planned steps in the design process. Um, they got it late this spring, and we were able to have a meeting with them in late August for their verbal feedback. We still haven't received any written feedback from them, but it was a, what they call a, a preliminary review. And we can share the, some of the results with that, uh, of that meeting with you today. If, if you're interested. Um, and then in terms of next steps where we're going with this, um, the, the bottom bullet point is really kind of the, the most important milestone here, which is by summer of 2019, the grant needs to expires and we need to be completed with the project. Um, we also need to send it back through Caltrans one more time and they usually take three or four months for their review. So we're trying to get on a track here where we finish up the design process in the next few months so we can get it to Caltrans early in the year, give them enough time to do their work and get the, the project wrapped up before we um, uh, hit the, the deadline for the, 
granting agency. Um, as I mentioned, this is a significant design challenge. We're trying to get both pedestrians and bicyclists safely across San Pablo while keeping San Pablo as functional for, for motorists, for transit, and so forth, and for businesses that are located along the street. Um, and um, this particular segment of San Pablo is difficult because all the streets are staggered. The cross streets, the east-west streets are staggered. It would be a lot easier if they were all four-way, normal four-way intersections. Um, and then again, as I mentioned before, Washington is the, currently the only designated east-west bike route to get people from the west side of town across San Pablo towards um, schools, Memorial Park, so on and so forth. Um, this is a brief summary of some of the design considerations. I won't read these through, but again, it's, it's a long list of, of different characteristics of the, the street that we want to make sure are addressed. Um, and um, again, we can come back to this if it's helpful later on in your discussions. Uh, so to, to get to the three alternatives that we have for you to consider, um, the first alternative A is where we last left it with the commission. Um, this would be a two-way protected bicycle path on the west side of the street. And um, this is a, a um, image of the, of the plan. It's um, just to get everybody oriented. This, the north is to the left. So this is Washington. This is the gas station. Um, I'm sorry for getting the name of the gas station right now. But I think. Um, and then um, across the street are um, businesses over here. This is Washington Avenue. And this is Mechanics Bank over on this corner to help get you oriented. And this would be um, the cycle track here sidewalk against the businesses, and then this would have a, um, a hawk signal, pedestrian activated signal here, and this would be a, a, um, a, a standard intersection, signalized intersection here. Um, the, the key design feature and the key concern is that the construction of the cycle track would require elimination of the street parking on this side, and we've heard the importance of the street parking to the businesses. Um, alternative B is the idea of a shared use sidewalk where essentially the bicyclists and we don't have a good drawing of this and it really doesn't have a lot of changes to the infrastructure. It would basically be an arrangement where the sidewalk, where bicyclists and pedestrians would share the sidewalk. Um, it probably would involve some modifications to the sidewalk to eliminate landscaping. Um, I think there's at least one tree there that would need to be removed and um, this would allow for the bicyclist to be off the street it would also allow the street parking to stay. Um, it, it is less expensive, but it does still have some significant issues, particularly with, um, you know, with respect to the interface between bicyclists and pedestrians on the sidewalk and the driveways of um, going into the various businesses. Um, alternative C, which you'll hear more from Andrew in a moment, um, is a new concept that came out of some brainstorming that we did and, and a comment that we received from, from Caltrans, which is essentially to create um, a, two interconnected signals on the two in parts of the Washington-San Pablo intersections. And by doing that, we could then introduce essentially a bicycle phase to that signal. So a bicyclist would have a period of time uh, where they could enter the intersection and, and make their maneuvers. Um, this is, um, is um, probably less, a little bit more stressful than having a, a separated cycle track, but at least the bicyclist has their, the roadway to themselves and also provides an opportunity not to impact um, the street parking by the construction of the cycle track. Um, and I think at this point, if I may, turn it over to Andrew to go into more detail on this and then we can wrap up. Good evening, Commissioners. Just uh, let me pull up the presentation. Welcome. Okay, good evening, Commissioners. Uh, Andrew Lee with Precy Transportation Consulting, uh, traffic engineer with the firm, and I'm on the project team with BKF on the full San Pablo corridor and Buchanan project. Um, 
as Jeff mentioned, uh, this is tr trying to figure out another alternative, another option to consider regarding how to span the connection for bicyclists um, from one leg of Washington to the other. Um, we've got two options, and this was a third option that came up. Um, I, I believe Commissioner McCroskey actually mentioned it in our prior review uh, about what it would take to introduce a traffic signal only option. Uh, because there's existing infrastructure out there and there's some possibilities. So just to refresh everybody's um, uh, acquaintance with the corridor, um, to the left is north, to the south, excuse me, to the right is south. Um, and I've marked out where the existing crosswalks are and there's existing signal equipment at Washington Avenue North or West, however you plan to, uh, how, however you like to acquaint yourself with that. It currently runs with the two-phase signal, and what that means is there's one signal phase that goes with San Pablo North-South, and then that goes for a certain period of time, a rather long period of time, uh, and I'll explain why. And then Washington, uh, it going in the eastbound direction, gets a certain amount of time, about 30 seconds. So in total, this is at least in the PM uh, commute hours, the overall cycle length for this intersection is 130 seconds. And that's because San Pablo Avenue operates on what's called signal coordination, meaning signals at one intersection are timed in a way so that they're compatible to give a green light from one intersection to the next to the next so that you don't get a green light at one intersection and then a red light at the next one and then a green light. It sort of cuts down on the herky-jerkiness of the flow and allows you to progress forward. The trade-off for that, however, is that you get some rather small intersections like Washington Avenue North where it's going to be a long green for the San Pablo traffic and a rather short green for the Washington traffic. And so somebody who's a pedestrian wanting to cross San Pablo can hit the button and they can wait up to almost two minutes before they're gonna get the pedestrian signal to cross. And so this is heavily favorable for the vehicle traffic on San Pablo, um, but it's a little bit of a hassle for somebody who's trying to cross. Uh, we've already gone through the cycle track concept, um, and I will just add that in the discussions with Caltrans, um, in their review, they mentioned that one possibility in addition to the uh, pedestrian hawk signal at Washington Avenue South or East, that uh, considering a full signal uh, would be uh, something that could also improve the operations there. And so taking that idea and also some previous comments received, we developed a signal only concept. So one of the first things to introduce on this concept is that we would be taking the crosswalk on Washington Avenue North or west and moving it over to the other side. And I'll explain why, uh, but also showing a new signal at Washington East. And we're showing a few uh, boxes, uh, these are bike boxes adjacent to the uh, vehicle lane. And this is where the bicyclist would queue or wait for the traffic light to turn green uh, before they make their move. Okay. So, um, I just want to bring up that the traffic signal and the signs, as you see them, they are not purposely upside down, or by mistake, that is, they're uh, oriented to appear in the right direction for the traffic approaching. So, just want to make that clear. Um, for the very first phase of this bicycle signal phase only operation, um, what we would present is a bicycle signal. So these would be in addition to the vehicle signals, okay? Uh, so the vehicle signal would be showing red. The vehicles are not supposed to move during this phase. It would be a bicycle only phase. And you would get about 15 seconds in total. So 12 seconds of green and then yellow and red to get through the intersection. And the timing on this is governed by the uh, California Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, which says uh, you need a certain amount of time to get through the intersection, uh, specifically for people on bikes. Um, there's a six second startup time that you get where they assume that nobody's moving, but they're just getting their bike going. Uh, and then they assume somewhere in the order of a travel time through the intersection of 10 miles an hour. Okay, so 
that's how we came up with these times. All right, continuing on. So this, you get this 15 and a half second time, this bike burst. This is actually enough time for somebody to make a left turn on the San Pablo because San Pablo is still a legal bike route. And we had to make sure that there's enough time to get through the intersection, regardless of whether you're turning left or right. Now, if you did manage to turn right, um, that 15 and a half seconds may not have been enough time to get through the intersection. In fact, according to the MUTCD, it's not enough for somebody riding at 10 miles an hour. There's an overall bicycle clearance distance that we calculated of about 250 feet, and that's from the bike box all the way through the intersection and clearing conflicting traffic on the other leg of Washington. And so with that, um, the second phase, so the first phase being just the green, just the bikes going, that turns red. And then the bicyclists uh, who are trying to make this uh, right movement would be in the center left turn lane, which currently exists right now. And so they would be in opposing pockets, uh, left turn pockets, and they would see the green left turn signal. And you'll notice that the bicycle signal at the intersections of Washington and San Pablo would be showing red. So it, Bicyclists would, should not be entering the intersection once the left turn arrows are going. And that's because um, if there is vehicle traffic on San Pablo in the left turn pocket, they can make that left and the bicyclists would be following behind them. But the idea is that there would not be any vehicles behind the bicyclists. So the bicyclists would get that green burst, they would go uh, and they would make the left and they would get about 20 seconds in total to clear uh, that crossover on San Pablo. At the same time, because we moved the crosswalks uh, over um, at Washington Avenue North, uh, we could show the left turn signal while the pedestrians are going, and that would be essentially a long pedestrian um, crossing phase, at least to start. And then to end, we would have all of the left turn signals turn off. It would be a green signal for general vehicle traffic on Washington Avenue, north and south, to make the left turn or right turn onto San Pablo. And this is after the, the bicyclists should have cleared the intersection. If you do have some cyclists who have a hard time getting through the intersection, uh, what they would do, like let, let's say they didn't manage to make the left turn, onto the other leg of Washington, they could position themselves and queue in the left turn pocket. And so they would not be exposed to traffic um, behind them um, in a general lane. They would have a left turn uh, pocket to, to stage themselves for when the left turn signal activates for the next time. Uh, I'm gonna go through this just really quickly, but essentially in, in the evenings, uh, as I said before, it's 130 seconds for the overall cycle time. Uh, San Pablo currently gets 100 seconds of this 130 seconds, uh, and this would be cut down by about 18 seconds to get it to 82 seconds, which is still, honestly, a lot of time. Uh, in the morning, the overall cycle time is 120 seconds, so we're just talking about a difference of 10 seconds. Uh, so almost the same. Um, and we also did a level of service analysis or a, a, a intersection delay analysis. The intersection as it operates now is at what uh, we'd call a level of service A, which means that the delay is less than 10 seconds on average for all of the vehicles going through the intersection. And with this proposal, it would degrade just slightly by about five seconds or so to level of service B. So still very, very good service and low delay overall for the traffic passing through here. All right, I'm just going to summarize then what the relative advantages and disadvantages are. I uh, want to acknowledge that with the other alternatives that we've considered, there are advantages and disadvantages as well, and it's just a matter of um, you know, what we can live with. Uh, so the advantages here, faster implementation and lower cost on the cycle track, meaning that there would not be any curb work. There would not be any reconstruction of the sidewalk uh, on the west side of San Pablo. Uh, the other advantage also is that this could be an initial phase because the cycle track concept could use a traffic signal or a hawk, but if we were to construct this option with a traffic signal, it could be incorporated later into a ultimate cycle track design if so pursued by the city. 
Uh, and lastly, that there is not a whole lot of effect on San Pablo traffic coordination, meaning it's not going to introduce a whole lot of delay to the overall flow along the San Pablo corridor. Okay, the disadvantages. We are moving people on bikes into the vehicle lanes and ideally with the traffic signal timing, we'd try to clear out that short segment of San Pablo between Washington, North and South, so that there wouldn't be any cars there as people on bikes are riding into that left turn pocket. But that may not always be the case, especially in periods where there's congestion along San Pablo and there's traffic stopped. And so people on bikes may have to try to get around stopped traffic or at least, you know, weave in between vehicles. And that is harder than having a dedicated facility. Uh, people who are um, not able to ride as quickly as 10 miles an hour, um, so small children, maybe older adults, um, they may have a hard time clearing the intersection and they may not feel comfortable uh, waiting in the left turn pocket. Um, and then lastly, uh, although not comprehensively, uh, there's a possibility for what I've written down as bicycle signal violation by vehicles. That's just a wonky way of saying that somebody seeing the bicycle signal turn green may think, oh, that's my signal too, and turn, and there could be a conflict with the people on bikes making their turns as well. And so there's a matter of education for drivers. I've got a few other slides about certain different scenarios and um, what happens if there aren't bikes and there's just vehicles. Um, I'm not sure I really wanna go into that, although if the questions come up, I, I can certainly touch on that. And with that, I can turn it over to the commission for discussion. So I just wanna say, um I see some new faces. So in terms of flow, what usually happens at this point is the commission gets a chance to ask questions and uh, query staff and, and the presenter. And then we open it up to a period of public comment on the item, go through that, close that, come back, and then the commissioners get to express their opinions and uh, come to some kind of hopefully consensus on where to go next. So this is our chance as a commission to ask questions of the presenter. Does anybody have any questions they want to start with? Okay. okay. Uh, first, uh, for Jeff, when you talked about the summer 2019 deadline, that's to get an approved design or to actually build something? Uh, just to complete the design process for complete us to design. be able to charge the consultant fees to... Okay. To so the, the construction is a yeah, whole the construction is schedule. a separate... Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, now getting into some of the details of this very interesting idea that's just been presented. Um, so my first question is about activation. What would a bike person on a bicycle do something special to trigger the bike signal to activate or would it activate in every cycle or would they push a button or? There's a variety of equipment available out there. Um, but most commonly we're experiencing right now is video signal detection. So there's a video camera on the signal equipment. It, sh it is capturing an image of the areas where bicyclists and cars would be stationed. And if it detects a change in that image, so something entering a zone, it should activate. So um, it can tell whether there's a person there on a bike as opposed to a car in that same location? It's supposed to define certain zones. Um, and so I showed a bike box. Uh, you know, ideally it would be pavement marking, possibly green, and anything entering into that zone would ostensibly activate the bicycle signal crossing. So if a car was pulling up and expecting to turn right and kind of instinctively positioning themselves in the bike box, which they shouldn't really do, but if that was their their intuitive path of travel, they would inadvertently trigger the bike. Phase. That is a possibility, yes. Okay. Uh, I think there's some calibration that could be done with the signal equipment to try to differentiate based on size, but I would also expect that there could be some false positives along the way. But really, the, if the drivers did that repeatedly, they'd realize that they're just slowing themselves down by doing that, right? 
That's true. And I'll also mention that there are other alternatives to that. Um, so that's a passive detection method. There are active detection methods, something as simple as a push button next to um, the queuing area would not trigger such a signal and uh, could also provide the feedback to a person on a bike to see that when they push the button, it says that the signal has been alerted and you will might, be detected. Might give people more confidence that it's really going to work for them. That's true, yes. Okay, um, have you envisioned how a person on a bike would know what path to follow or would they, like would we be putting in some kind of green markings to show this kind of S-shaped route they're expected to take? Yeah, ideally we would introduce uh, either a shared lane marking, green back shared lane marking, uh, Shero, um, or, and probably additional signage as well um, to, to illustrate the route. Um, there are examples of this like um, in Berkeley, also crossing San Pablo um, by the Berkeley Bowl, I forget the street. Um, um, Is that Heinz? Yeah. Heinz, yes, exactly. Where um, it's a it's a sign that has uh, a little bend in it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and finally, when you talked about the level of service for people driving on San Pablo being degraded from A to B, are you considering the level of service just for the Washington intersection, or are you able to extrapolate from that to how people's experience of driving through North Albany altogether? would be affected like so we have the we have the entire network modeled uh, from end to end and the particular analysis was at Washington uh, and when we did run the simulation it was showing that for a large swaths of time uh, San Pablo was getting the green uh, and actually the major choke point is not so much the intersections uh, Washington northward because most of those are um, long green times for San Pablo traffic but uh, Solano is the one that chokes everything up where uh, the green time allocated for San Pablo traffic actually drops a lot because there's just many more complex movements there. And we've also talked about reducing the number of phases at the, San, at the Solano intersection so that there would just be a left turn, a, a double left turn phase and then a straight through phase instead of an eastbound phase and a westbound phase. Would that throw off the calculations you've done or do you think that it? That would make it, that would make it better for the overall corridor and it would not affect the specific calculation that we did. Before. Okay, so, so your conclusion that this change doesn't significantly degrade the experience of drivers passing through Albany, you think is fairly robust? I do. If, even if you look at a bigger, longer stretch of San Pablo and different options for Solano, it all halts up. But I do, uh, specifically because the, oh, what is it, the choke point, the, uh, the log jam is the, not here, it's right. elsewhere. Okay, and, the, and what we're doing here wouldn't create a new choke point here, it would just, be, okay. All right, that's it for my questions, thanks. To, to follow up quickly on what Harry mentioned, um, what is the amount of green time that's given to San Pablo and Solano along San Pablo today? So I assume it's less than 82 seconds in that. It is less than 82. I think it was on the order of like 45 to 47 okay. or something okay. like that. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, and my two other questions were um, the ped phases. So the ped phases, would they share with any of the, of the bike phases or are they going to have? Yeah. Let's see here. So the ped phases would share with the bike phases, but only on this left turn. So the bikes should not be turning against the peds, and that's why we move the crosswalks over. Um, Got it, on the outsides. On the outside. And then, actually, this is not enough time for the pedestrian to clear fully at the intersection. So what happens then is when the left turn phase turns off, the vehicle phase at Washington would turn on, which makes this essentially a... 15 second leading pedestrian interval, yeah. whereas they are typically three to seven seconds. Um, a person walking should be about halfway through the intersection by the time 
the vehicle traffic gets a green light. Makes sense. Um, and then for, for, you mentioned about how there are bikes that would have, cyclists that would have challenges getting through the intersection in the amount of allotted time. So what would happen if you, if you get the bike phase, you make your, your right turn into um, San Pablo, and then the signal changes, um, what, what's the next phase that happens? Do you get green? You get the, you get the left turn arrow. With the car, with the vehicles. With the left, with the vehicles except there would not be any vehicles coming behind you, either coming behind you on San Pablo or coming behind you from Washington. It would only be bicyclists trying to get into the left turn pocket. Any vehicles that you may encounter would be the ones that were already in the intersection before you got the green signal. So there's a possibility that there'd be somebody in the left turn pocket waiting to turn and the person on bike would follow them in clearing the intersection. So as a cyclist, you would end up queuing in the left turn lane as a vehicle would. You wouldn't have like a bike box or anything like that. You wouldn't need it, I guess, because right. you're just behind the vehicles. Right. But then if you were so slow on the bike that you didn't complete the left turn in time, you'd be stuck in that left turn pocket. You would be then, in the left turn pocket, yes. And then you'd have the fast highway traffic zooming by you. It would be next to you, yes, but you would have a place to stand in the left turn pocket. In the pocket. Yes. And, and would that be a prohibited left turn movement for vehicles at that point? I think it would be because if we're going to introduce a left turn signal, um, I think a matter of consistency that... Uh, it would be a protected left turn or signalized left turn arrow at all times for all left turns would be preferable. So the green arrow would change to a red arrow? Yes, it would. So then you're waiting in a fairly quiet place with stopped, you may have some stopped cars behind you at that point, but they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be like, they wouldn't be trying to pass you. Stressing you, you out by trying to make you go. They wouldn't be a car trying to get around you to, to get go through. You. It would be a car stopped with the understanding that they are going to let get a left turn arrow as well. But you would have two phases to try to get through this, it sounds like. So you're going to have the bike phase to make the right turn, and then you're going to have the left turn phase to, to make the left turn. How many seconds for each again? Actually, what I'd like to suggest is you take, it, take us through the whole cycle once more. Sure. That would be great. That'd be good. Okay. <laughs> so the default setting for the intersection, San Pablo gets green. Uh, we're actually going to show left turn arrows as red for this particular phase. So all traffic wanting to turn left from San Pablo onto Washington would queue in the left turn pocket if there were any. Okay. So... It, the signal gets activated by a person on a bike. They show a, all the signals on San Pablo turn red. It shows the green signal for the bikes. It also shows a no right turn uh, blank out sign for vehicles. Uh, bicycles are allowed to turn left or right. You get about 12 seconds of green to start and in total it's 15 and a half seconds before that signal shuts off. Then. The left turn arrows, the left turn phase from San Pablo turns on. So somebody who made the right turn has to ride from that, uh, from Washington into the left turn pocket on San Pablo. And now they're trying to get down and make that left turn onto the other leg of Washington. You get 17 seconds of green time and then you're yellow and red for a total of 20 and a half seconds. The pedestrians crossing San Pablo are going simultaneously with you. In that last phase, can you bring it back up? Yes. Any cars that were queued in the left turn pockets would clear out first. That is correct. And the bikes would come in behind them. That's correct. Okay. Third phase, the left turn arrow, left turn phase shuts off. It shows red. Washington traffic gets a general green ball, meaning that they can now turn right or left onto San Pablo. And that lasts for approximately 12 seconds, which is enough time to clear the pedestrians and is also enough time to clear most of the vehicle traffic on Washington because it's a fairly low trafficked uh, street at both of these intersections. And then it's gonna revert back to San Pablo Green and run for about 80 seconds.
Other questions? Could we try that? Try. <laughs> Could we mock it up and try it for a week? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think you could. You'd have to do manual traffic control to get it that so way. So maybe a day. Maybe a day. Maybe you pick a Saturday or something, Saturday morning. Um, well, you get a chance. Hang on. Um, one other thing to test also is um, can you really get up to 10 miles an hour? Um, what does that feel like to you, to someone else who, you know? To somebody on training wheels. Exactly, yeah. Um, you know, let me add one more thing that I didn't actually put in the presentation, but um, with the crosswalks and the additional signal on Washington Avenue South, um, if people who did not feel comfortable getting into general flow of traffic wanted to ride the sidewalk, then they could still ride the sidewalk and they would have that additional signal to the south to use to cross in the crosswalk and they would be properly aligned in the direction that they want to go. Meaning if you were coming from Washington Avenue north and you went along the west sidewalk and then you hit the button to use the crosswalk, you would wind up on the correct side of Washington going east and vice versa. I, I think it works both ways. It works if both you, ways. Uh, I have to say, though, if you walked your bicycle on the sidewalk. <laughs> but you're, you're now expecting that the person going eastbound would use the west sidewalk, and the person bicycling westbound would use the east sidewalk. That's right. OK. Any other questions? All right. So we'd like to turn it over to public comment. And what we're going to do is uh, invite you to come on up. And uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll write down your questions, and we'll get them answered at the end of public comment. So we would appreciate, for those of you who are comfortable, giving us uh, speaker cards. Um, and just bring them up, and we'll call people out in order. If you prefer not to, then that's OK, too. Would you? So I have two cards starting with Valerie Risk and Brian Martin. Evening. Hi, I'm Valerie Risk. Um, I'm a 13 year resident of Albany. I teach physics at Albany High School. And um, I, I ride my bike to Albany High School every day from Albany Hill. And so I guess I would consider myself a cyclist, although it's a really short trip. Um, but I cycle every day from central Albany Hill to what I consider central Albany, which is Albany High School. But if you think about it, it's also Memorial Park. Um, it's also the swimming pool, right? There are many people who go to that block for many reasons. Parents pushing kids in strollers, um, many high school kids. Even middle school and elementary school kids who are going with their siblings part way, and then they peel off and go to the middle school. And um, I never take Washington. Now, I think it's a great idea to add more bicycle boulevards. But for those of us who live in the 600 and 700 block of Albany Hill, central Albany Hill funnels down to Castro Street, unless you want to go a block out of your way. So we go, we go down Castro Street, we, we cross either where the new Ocean View Brewery is or um, half slightly over where Portland Avenue is. And there are crosswalks there already. They're very dangerous. I, I just last week almost got hit by a car who just didn't see me, you know? And um, there are kids crossing there every day, twice a day, getting to school. And they're playing Frogger to get across this street. It's really, really scary. It's five lanes of, of cars expecting to not stop. They're expecting to not stop. They think they're on a highway. And um, I've, I, so I, I'm kind of curious uh, why there isn't a meeting about the crossing, the main crossing to Albany High School and to Memorial Park, which is the crossing at Portland Avenue, not Washington Avenue. 
Um, and I think Washington Avenue is great to have a good crossing there. For people who are going from Albany Hill to somewhere further away, like Berkeley, um, or Solano Avenue, then they would go to Washington. But if you're just going to a local place like the high school, um, it, I, I'd like to see more focus on getting kids to school safely. I also know kids that have almost gotten hit um, or you know, almost had a serious accident um, with cars just not seeing them crossing there. It's, it's, I, I've seen a plan for improvements at, at um, Portland Avenue but it just includes more crosswalks. There's no signal, and I've been told that it's not possible to add additional signals. Uh, however, on Washington Street, I hear we're adding an additional signal on Washington Avenue South. So I would like um, the council to consider adding an additional signal at Port Portland Avenue, which is a major crossing for many people in Albany, and it would be good to have some data about how many people cross at Portland Avenue and what is the flow of traffic on San Pablo during those crossing times, which are big commute times as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Brian Martin, and uh, I, I'll, I live with Valerie. We come from the same place, and so um, <clears throat> the street crossings on San Pablo are very important. They're very scary. And uh, so uh, I wholeheartedly support improvements to the crossing at Washington. Um, and uh, one of the aspects of the last thing that we saw that sounds promising to me, um, and I would encourage the commission to pursue the version C, sounds like a low impact way to try things out. Um, our kids ride bikes all over the town and I would, uh, encourage uh, people to think about um, improvements to, uh, if, if people go with that separate bike signal, uh, make sure it's really clear to kids what to do. Um, and uh, one concern is that there might be like big signs saying no left turn or something, but yet bikes can actually do all turns there at that when it's their turn. So somehow we've seen with the Hawk signal by Belmont Village that it's very confusing to people, to drivers, like what do the blinking lights mean? What does the solid red mean? Um, and extra better signage there would be helpful. Better sign, uh, really clear signage at the, at the Washington crossing I think would be helpful. I really like the idea of putting the crosswalk um, moving it from the gas station to the uh, to the Mallard, basically, um, I think uh, that would help people coming from north of Washington. Um, first, it help help people go back and forth to those bars <laughs> from the Mallard and the and the tap room, um, and uh, I'm sure they could use all the help they can get to have a straight path. Um, but, uh, but also for people trying to cross at Portland, which is a, a huge concern for us and it should be for others, um, it would be helpful to have that light, that crosswalk on the northern side closer to Portland so that if you are coming from the north and you want to go cross uh, to go to the Memorial Park, the pool, the high school, um, you can hit that crosswalk without having to also cross Washington to the, which is what you currently have to do. Uh, so few people actually take the light. If you're coming from north of Washington, uh, we know almost nobody that ever goes all the way down to Washington where the light is to cross and then go back up north to, to get to Portland. But it would help to have that crosswalk um, on the northern side. Thank you. Council, um, I'm Larry from United Transmission. I, I have to interrupt. We're, we're not actually a council. Okay. We make recommendations to the okay. city council. We're okay. just a commission. Thank you. All right, but I like to say the plan three of our C looks great. I like how the sidewalks are moved. Um, as far as the kids, I'd say most of the kids that ride right in front of the business, they're all coming down the sidewalk. They're, I wouldn't say they're probably all under 10 years old, and the parents do cross them right there at Washington towards the bank. And most, the adults do ride up and down the sidewalk there. Um, you guys could, I mean, I'd love to just sit there one morning and watch how many kids come up and cross there. You would see a lot. The, the singles, like you say, would make greater sense. The Huck and Light, I watched that a few times. I went down and sat there and watched it. It is confusing. I and mean, people are too big of a rush today. Unfortunately, like you said, try to cross the side 
to the light like you were doing earlier. The guy, you guys had, you know, had a discussion about it. But I say you guys, I think that Plan C would be great. With leave the traffic alone for the businesses, we could still operate and instead of blocking the number one lane. If you did have the curb going out all the way to the lane, we have tow trucks, the pump trucks, and all that could be sitting there 30, 45 minutes an hour in the first lane, which would be bad for traffic flow. So, like I say, that light I think would be awesome. That setup. Um, like I say, if you guys want to come by, sit there with us for. Get some coffee. We'll watch. Like, see, you could literally see how many people cross there in the morning. Kids and all that. It's it's a lot. And yes, I agree with Portland. They say at least if they move it to the north side of the Washington, I mean there is an access so people go right up to Portland pretty easily too. Like, say it's important all the way in Albany to have crosswalks. But I say at least if we have a one towards the middle where. You have two corridors that take you up to Solano or one up to towards Portland would be great. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you. After Amy will be David Dobney, Dobney and um, Preston Jordan. Hi, I'm Amy Smolens. I do not live on Albany Hill or work on Albany Hill. Um, but as a vehicular cyclist, I like this as a good compromise. And with the uh, skip striping, I think the green skip striping would help. And maybe it would help, maybe this treatment would help get the kids, you know, kind of create the next generation of vehicular cyclists, kind of get them used to riding in the road with the, with the protective signal, the markings, things like that. Um, one thing I'm wondering if the video signal um, detects continuous cyclists uh, or additional bikes, like if I'm riding and then I'm halfway across and then Valerie comes and she, well, if there's a button, either hits the button or, or um, the video senses her, does it then, do you get a new 15 seconds? So if there's a group of cyclists or a group of kids going to school, is it going to continuously stay on or is it just going to, is the first one going to just bam, 15 seconds, seven seconds? and then turns red again. So that's my question. Thank you. Uh, Dave Danby. Uh, I wasn't going to say anything about Portland and San Pablo, but as somebody that uh, used to go down there regularly uh, during school time, it's not, a, it's not a good intersection, and I would encourage you to try to include that to make it better and safer for people going across there. When you're in a car, it's hard to see, uh, especially when it's dark, somebody starts to walk off there. Um, but I did have a question on the, on the C plan. Um, with the two left turn areas, is San Pablo then still five lanes there or six? Otherwise, the two left turn lanes would sort of would back into each other. And I'm just wondering, is there enough space to do that if you have cars and, and bikes? It wasn't clear on the diagram to me uh, how that works. Thank you. Good evening, Commission, staff. Uh, thanks for the creative thinking on this. Preston Jordan speaking for myself, by the way. Not strollers and rollers, even though I often do that, but as I'm a candidate, that's not appropriate at this time, so I'm speaking individually. Um, I think option C is nice because it allows for staging to option A, potentially, if needed. Uh, I would suggest reaching out to the community that accesses the Albany Children's Center because I think there's a lot of people that ride from Albany east of San Pablo to that destination. Um, and so while they're Obviously, there are a lot of people crossing at Portland, as has been mentioned. We've also heard there's a, you know, a lot of large population that comes from Pierce Street, the residences on Pierce Street, and up over the hill on Washington and drops down, so it is an important crossing. But that population that uses Albany Children's Center, I think it would be important to accommodate them. I know I have a neighbor who has a, a long tail bike that they just electrified and they put both their kids on the back, and so I would want her to feel comfortable going through there. That would be the goal I would have in mind. So I'd ask you to get feedback on that. Um, I know Portland's not on the agenda, but as far as Portland, it sounds like a great spot for a hawk signal, potentially. Um, thanks. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, I just have a few questions. Um, so uh, one of my questions is, I looked like there was going to be 32 and a half seconds for the pedestrians total because it gets triggered at one point and then there's, I'm not sure. I just want to know how long the pedestrians have. I, I was trying to add up numbers while you're doing it. And then my second question is, they're going to be a separate, are the pedestrians pushing a different button than the, because the pedestrians are in the crosswalk, so there's going to be like two places where you press buttons, one for the pedestrians and one for the bicyclists. I wasn't clear like how, how exactly that worked. And then um, my third, third one is actually just, um, how about if we didn't have coordinated green lights on San Pablo so that cars had to stop more often and had to slow down? Because it seems like part of the problem is they just truck through, have all these lights. It works great for them, not so great for the pedestrians. They, um, so maybe instead of being a fast place, um, maybe it could be a slow street. And then, um, and then my fourth question is just, how did Washington come to be the, the bicycle? How, how was that decided? Um, just, just out of curiosity. Thanks. Thank you. So I do, I do not have any more speaker cards. Anyone else? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission. And we had a number of questions. So if we could get you back up to the podium. I'm just going to run through what I heard, and uh, commissioners jump in if I miss something. Um, so there was a question about the pedestrian, or I'm sorry, the uh, the initial cycling trigger. Um, is it 15 seconds regardless of number of cyclists? Yeah, uh, I think the question is like. Would the bicycle phase, could the bicycle phase be extended when it detects more bicyclists? Um, the way we have it right now, this is presenting timing on a minimum, but I have a caveat to that, which is, if we were thinking about just facilitating the crossings from Washington to make the right turn, this green time could be as little as six seconds um, because you just need to get the bike started and then there would be enough time here to clear them out. However, we are actually being generous with the amount of green time in this phase because we're actually timing the bicyclists to get through all the way on a left turn because that's a legal movement. Um, that's one aspect. Uh, the other aspect, at least in one direction, being the eastbound direction, is that it's a bit of a downhill. And so if there were trailing cyclists, I believe they would be able to pick up speed at more than somebody starting from a full stop, possibly. Um, and so they could be able to catch up with the bicyclists who had gotten um, to the signal and waited for the green light and started from a full stop. Um, I think in terms of possibilities, if it was a passive detection system with video detection and we could negotiate something with Caltrans where they were comfortable decreasing the San Pablo corridor time by a little bit more, it's worth talking to them about. Um, but I don't have any guarantees that it, it could be done. I mean, technically it could be done. It's just a mad, it's a trade-off, right? It's a trade-off of there's a little bit more delay to the traffic on San Pablo. If we're willing to live with a little, maybe they're willing to live with just a little bit more. So it's, it's a possibility. Great. Um, another question was, um, I, I think that the question really goes to how wide is San Pablo was the question, but how much space is there in the pockets? Yeah, so um, I don't know exactly. I have the bike clearance distance listed as 250, and so I'm sort of uh, spitballing back here. I think it's about 150 feet between intersections, which would give you two 60-foot pockets plus the tapers. Um, so the pockets, as we've um, conceptualized, would be back-to-back -back left turn pockets, and it would allow for storage of paint only or paint and um, it could be a raised curb. It would be a small, skinny raised curb yeah. uh, threading itself uh, between the two pockets. Um, but it could be done. 
But you're not imagining two pockets side by side creating six lanes on San Pablo? I am not. Okay, that's... That would require parking removal. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I just want to mention um, there have been previous meetings about the designs for the Portland and uh, Castro and there's one more Brighton crossings and uh, as I understand it those those plans are a little more far along so we're not meeting on those currently um, and they will come back to traffic and safety at some point right and if anyone has any questions just let me know we can share what we have on this great thank you um, so there were some more questions uh, what's the total time for pedestrians to cross yeah it's uh, 32 and a half seconds uh, so it would start um, when the San Pablo left turn turns on and it would conclude when the Washington vehicle traffic uh, finishes so it would be number three and number four or also that little sidebar four would be east-west pedestrians so 32 and a half seconds which is enough time to clear I think I have it listed 76 feet um, at three and a half feet per second with a startup interval of seven seconds and not counting the time in the yellow and the red face. So it's, uh, it's according to recommended uh, timing from MUTCD. I'm, I'm sorry, what's the recommended timing from M MUTC? Oh, uh, sorry, <laughs> I was just getting in, a uh, little too technical. There's a flashing don't walk time, and that's the time needed to clear 76 feet at three and a half feet per second. Okay. There's a startup time that doesn't count towards that, and I put that in as seven seconds, which is uh, recommended for commercial corridors. Uh, and then there's the yellow and red time, which sometimes you can count towards the clearance time, but we didn't. So what you're saying is it, it meets the threshold and yeah. or exceeds it? Exceeds it a little bit, yes. Great. And Thank just you. to clarify, you said three and a half feet per second. I think if people heard that number, they might have been thinking, I can't walk that fast, but three and a half feet per second is less than two miles per hour. So it's actually a very moderate walking speed, just to clarify. Thank you. Um, so actually, I think I can answer this question. There was a question about buttons. And uh, I think you previously explained that this is a video detection. So unless we specify. Or buttons. Or buttons. Or it could be buttons. OK. Yeah. But they would be located in different places, presumably. They would be because the pedestrians would be situated in one place on a curb near the curb ramp, and the cyclists would be in the lane, and they're not in the same place. So it would be two. Right, they're separated places. by the two traffic lanes. Exactly. So yeah. it's pretty good separation. Um, and uh, and then there was a question: Why Washington was chosen for this particular treatment? I think I'd have to turn that over to Jeff and Justin on that. It goes back to our original planning in the active transportation plan of creating a bicycle network and trying to create a network where it would serve the community the best and get people where they wanted to go. Um, and um, at that time, the Washington Avenue uh, was identified as the, the preferred east-west route across San Pablo. And I was on the transportation, uh, the Traffic and Safety Commission at that time, and, and as I remember it, um, Solano itself was considered a, a little too active in an intersection, and we thought that Washington would be a place where a more calm passage could be created. We have yet to see if that's true, but that was... ten is shorter than the other dog legs that we would contend with at the other staggered intersections? I, I believe that's true. I have to it's the only street that goes through north well, with the same name with the same name <laughs> uh, north of of Solano Avenue but if you think of what is it cast Castro and Portland as being one street it, sure. my impression is that it's more of a diversion along San Pablo to connect those two than it is to connect the two legs of Washington so so we maybe have the best hope of creating a a relaxed crossing at Washington compared to those other streets for for bicycle for east west bicycle travel. I think there's a lot that can be done to make pedestrian crossings safer at those other streets, but for through bicycle traffic going east west, 
it seems like Washington has some advantages. I was just going to kind of chime Please. in as far as why Washington's the bike route. Um, Preston raised one of the points as far as a lot of potential bike traffic coming over uh, the hill on Washington from the Gateview area. Uh, the other, as you mentioned, it's closest parallel street to Solano. So cyclists don't have to ride on Solano. And it has an existing signal. So all of those made it a little easier to cross San Pablo, um, close to destinations or origins. Um, and you know, while I wasn't part of all of those conversations, I, I think those are some of the key reasons why it was selected as the bike route for the ATP. And regarding the existing signal, someone commented, why are we considering adding a signal here but not adding a signal at Portland? And I think maybe you can speak to this, but I would think the reason is that when we add a signal here, because it's completely synchronized with the existing signal and it's close enough to the existing signal, it doesn't really degrade the traffic flow on San Pablo to add a new signal here, whereas to add a new signal at Portland would run into more problems of missed connections and... I agree. I think that's true, and we probably would have Caltrans considering this a single signal because it is integrated. So do we know how likely it is that Caltrans will go for this idea? <laughs> if we, have we talked to them about it, or has anybody gotten the beginnings of feedback? Oh, do we have a Caltrans person in the are, are you from Caltrans? Uh, would you like to come up? Great. <laughs> P please introduce yourself. Okay, I'm Vicki Havel. I'm project manager on this project. Um, I was at the meeting uh, August 29th, I believe, uh, where um, this project was presented. And I am like very surprised to see all this work that you guys did um, so quickly. I think it's a great concept, and my suggestion would be to get it to Caltrans, to our designers, as soon as possible, just to make sure that there aren't any major roadblocks to this design. You don't want to get too far into it. Um, I don't have, I'm project management, I don't have the technical expertise to say how likely it is at this point. Um, but if you guys want to bring this over and present it to us soon, it would be great if our traffic and safety and, and bike and ped group could see this and give you some feedback. Can I ask you a question? Um, what, what type of project review do you think this would be and would it fit in our timeline for um, completing design by, is it June 2019? I'm sorry, what was the first part of the what, question? What kind of um, uh, review do you think Caltrans, because there's right different kind of levels of review that you have for I projects. think when we um, gave the feedback for the uh, application for the grant, I believe we said 16 weeks. Do you guys remember? I'm not sure. Maybe it was Rob, oh, Roberts. <laughs> um, I believe our designers request 16 weeks. And it's not that it actually takes that long, but it just depends on our workload. Okay. And right now we have a lot. <laughs> so... <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for coming tonight and, and speaking out. Appreciate that. So, um, given what we heard, uh, it's time for us to express some opinions. Um, are there further questions? I'll start. Please. Um, I, I do like option C. I think, uh, from a perspective of simplicity, it's actually got some pretty good potential as far as the construction of the, the signal. Uh, getting people to understand you know, bike versus pedestrian, if you've got two signal heads up next to each other, one's a, a red ball and the other's a green bike, you know, maybe we throw some signs up, you know, cars follow car signal, bikes follow bike signal, something that is redundant, because I think just the nature of the signals by themselves is actually pretty clear if someone stops to think about it. The challenge is people don't always stop to think about it. Um, I did want to kind of respond to one of the comments, or some of the comments we've heard on the pedestrian hybrid beacons. Uh, one of the traditional reasons for using them is that they are theoretically cheaper than a full signal because it's kind of a half signal. Um, my experience with building one in Berkeley was it wasn't any cheaper. 
And I feel like, well, in that case, why don't I just go to the regular signal and, and configure it to work for bikes and pedestrians better than a traditional signal? Which here we have kind of that opportunity with a separate bike lane and the, the video detection will pick up the bikes in the bike lane. Uh, we can use the, the programming of the video detection to take narrow slices of the image. And so that you know, one or two narrow slices indicates it's a bike. More than that indicates it's a car or a truck or something else, and the, it won't trigger the bike phase. So the video detection can actually differentiate, and that's what we've done at the pedestrian hybrid beacon that we've got uh, at Ashby and Hillegas. But the placement is, is that much more certainty that the detection will be accurate. Um, one of the things that kind of had occurred to me is I sometimes take this route with my son going to the middle school or the high school, um, coming over the hill rather than diverting around, uh, which tends to be if we're running late because that's harder if I haven't stretched. Um, but coming down Washington, turning left onto San Pablo and then right on Portland, which is the route I would take, it's very easy to do with the signal. So with the current signal? With, with the current signal yep. in the traffic lane. Uh, my son and I both ride in the street. We see some kids ride in the street, some on the sidewalk. I fully recognize that. And at least for kids, it is legal to ride on the sidewalk. For adults, it's not. Um, well, actually, it's a commercial area, so it's not technically legal. Yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah. So that's why my kids don't run on the sidewalk. I understand. But also, I want them to be comfortable with it. But I, what I'm saying is it's, that's actually a very comfortable place for a cyclist to ride. Normally, I wouldn't let my kids ride on San Pablo. But that right there, left turn from a single lane, so there's only one lane of traffic behind you or with you, you can ride that short block on San Pablo. So I'm not too worried about that. That's served well. So from Washington, you can get to Washington or to Portland just fine. Uh, the other crossings, yeah, hopefully if we get some of the pedestrian improvements, that will help. I don't know that we can get crossings everywhere. Um, one of the questions we didn't address was um, how about abandoning the coordination on San Pablo Avenue? And aside from slowing down the buses, uh, which we do care about, slowing down the cars, which we may or may not care about depending on your philosophy, um, as a traffic engineer, my philosophy is you slow down the cars too much, what happens? They start looking for other routes. They're going to start cutting through the neighborhoods, so um, I wouldn't strongly uh, recommend that. We want them first on the freeway, next on San Pablo, last on our local streets. So keeping the flow is important. And I, I like that, uh, as Andrew's pointed out, this is not the critical point in the traffic flow on San Pablo. So reducing the through green time for San Pablo at Washington doesn't impact that through flow. And that's actually really important. Doing this at somewhere that was already the critical point would have that cumulative impact. Here we've got capacity to spare. So I think it's a very elegant solution. Anyway, I would happily move approval of option C as the, the preferred uh, route forward. Let's hear a little bit more, but uh, were you seconding? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, I, I didn't know if it was a motion yet, but let's hear more. I'll move it and we can discuss after we have the okay, motion. I'll up. second. And we'll have discussion. Um, yeah, I also like the option. Um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of trying to put in um, what would be considered for San Pablo unique infrastructure. If we put in, say, a cycle track that's in the roadway, um, San Pablo is, for better or worse, is the, the through the throughway, the north-south throughway, um, and it's difficult as a user of the roadway, whether you're in a car, bike, um, or other mode, um, to have to navigate the roadway and then have different roadway treatments as you go up and down the corridor. Um, so this is a very uh, simple solution that still leaves that possibility open if the solution um, doesn't work. Um, I think there was a question, Ken, that we've we missed um, from Preston, oh, which was uh, the outreach um, to oh, yeah. the Albany Children's Center. And so um, I don't know what, out, what type of outreach was done for this meeting. It looks like we have a decent attendance. For those of you guys who don't regularly attend, we usually have um, two people come to the meeting. <laughs> Maybe five. Um, yeah, yeah, it'll, yeah. It'll, it'll fluctuate. Yeah. Um, but uh, 
I, I hope that we can do um, um, a robust outreach for when this item goes to council so that we do have the right um, um, neighbors um, and adjacent property owners and, and businesses uh, uh, notified for that meeting. But yeah, I do support it. Did you have anything else? Just to thank the staff and engineers for thinking about this and coming up with this because it's completely new. At, it's, it's just wonderful that we have that kind of creativity at work to try to solve problems in, in unexpected ways. So thank you. And I, you know, I'm, I'm getting used to this. Uh, I, I, like, I like what you said about how Washington to Portland eastbound works now, which is a good proof of concept, I think, for the larger project. Um, also, even if on a cycle green, um, you know, you have cars following the bikes out of the legs of Washington, there's two lanes. Hopefully the cyclists are going to be moving over and we could stripe it so that they move over right away, get towards the pockets. There's a relief valve for those cars that maybe aren't behaving perfectly, but they're not threatening because they can be in the other lane. Um, so that that's heartening. I'm interested to see how it would work. Um, personally, I'd love to see it mocked up. I'm not sure if we have time for that in the process. I'm not sure we could pull that together right now, but in in this this portion of the design process. But um, let us kick that around and think of a, you know if there's a way we can we can test this out in in, in the street. Maybe it's appropriate to do it after the Caltrans review when we understand more what their parameters are and we just need to make sure that the timing works. Do you have any suggestions on that? Uh, I don't have to consult staff. Fair enough. I, I do think we should try to move forward with the Caltrans review as quickly as possible. Yeah. Do we need a fallback in case it can't be worked out with Caltrans? Do you need us to kind of choose between alternatives A and B tonight as a as our next choice? I, or can I you come our, back to us in that case? I think we would come back to you, and I think one of our fallbacks would be to carve this particular intersection, these two intersections, out of the, the larger project and move forward with the other pedestrian crossings um, on the schedule that we have and then just make this a separate project if we if we had to. But the sense I'm getting from the commission and the public is that, that we're, we've come across something here that um, you know, maybe we can just proceed as we intended with this modification to, uh, and um, finalize the design, well, not finalize, but get the design to the, to the next stage so that Caltrans can do their formal review. And, and if that doesn't work out and we end up having to choose between A and B and do that in a rush between say January and summer of 2019 that that can still be worked out we'll we'll figure we'll we'll try to figure we'll it out figure as that out doing. when it happens yeah. not yeah. now okay good shall we vote yeah. so we're voting on the motion to move forward with uh, option C all in favor aye aye, aye. opposed hearing none the motion carries all right. This is where I put in my traditional plug for you to stick around. Um, this Complete Streets project came out of a previous Complete Streets process, and we're going to go into another Complete Streets process right now at item 6-2. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> So thank you all for attending. We hope you stick around. We are talking about more interesting things. In fact, I think we're going to talk about back-in angle parking. Yes. Anybody have to, any opinions on back-in angle parking? We're going stick to talk around. about parking. Does anybody have any opinions about parking? <laughs> I'm just trying to get their attention. So if I can ask you to talk outside, thank you very much. We're going to keep going. Moving right along with item number 6-2. This is the presentation of the draft concept for Solano Avenue Complete Streets. 
and it's the plan. And uh, for this, I need to let you know that I live within about 500 feet, definitely of the intersection of Solano and Santa Fe, and very close to the intersection of Solano and Curtis. So we're going to mostly talk in generalities tonight. But if the, those particular intersections or the space between them comes up, you might see me disappear out of the room and recuse myself, at which point Robert here will automatically take over the meeting and continue in my absence. I'll be watching on a monitor in another room and we'll step back when it's appropriate. Any problems with that from the dais? No? You guys okay? Great. Harry and I have talked about this before. With that, I'm going to turn the meeting over to staff for item number 6-2. Yes. Um, good evening. I'll be fairly brief um, in my remarks. Um, just this, it, where we are right now on Solano Complete Streets, this was a process that started earlier in the year. Uh, we have a grant from Caltrans to develop a Complete Streets plan on Solano Avenue from Masonic up to the city limit line, which is about Tulare. Um, we have been working with Tool Design Group since about February. Um, we had our uh, community advisory group meeting in April, and most recently last week, we had a public workshop in May. And for any of you who made it out to Solano this past Saturday, we had a pop-up demonstration to um, give an example of what uh, you know a curb extension would look like with some greenery, and we uh, collaborated with Flowerland on that effort. Um, so we're back uh, here tonight um, to give you some um, the conceptual plans that have been uh, prepared thus far and to get your feedback and take public comment. Um, and Brooke uh, DuBose from Tool Design Group is here tonight to uh, give you an overview of where we are at this point in the process. Excellent. Thank you, Anne. Um, should I pull it up? Excellent. All right. Well, I'll start by saying that I'm also an Albany resident, so um, thank you for everything you do for us. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm Brooke DeBose. I'm with Tool Design Group. Um, we've had the pleasure of working with the city over the last six months, uh, and I'll just say it's been a really fun project, and, we, and we've enjoyed it a lot. Um, just by way of background, Tool Design Group, is, we're a transportation, um, planning, engineering, and urban design firm, um, and we've also teamed up with Opticos, who um, are great partners in placemaking and urban design work as well, um, and John Meeky, who I think has served on this commission as, as part of that effort too. So um, we're all really, really um, appreciative of being able to work in our backyard here. So enough about me. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about the schedule. So I believe my colleague Megan was here in June to meet with you all when I was out on vacation. Um, but we uh, got started in um, spring. Uh, we had a charrette process in late May, early June, where we invited the community to come out and walk the corridor with us. Um, heard from different stakeholders and um, business interests and community members along the corridor about their vision for Solano Avenue. Um, and then we got to work in this room where we were sketching out ideas, um, brainstorming, um, everything from traffic safety and circulation to big ideas around placemaking and really um, catalytic changes for, for the community. Um, since then, we've been working on the uh, conceptual design for the corridor, which we'll be sharing with you all tonight. Um, and as Anne mentioned, we had a really great weekend this past weekend where we um, set up shop at Flowerland and had a lot of conversations with people that were coming through, both from the neighborhood, but also people who traveled to the corridor on the weekend, which is really great to hear from them. Uh, and then we also did a pop-up demonstration at the corner of Pomona. Um, which was really interesting to see um, both how um, drivers and buses and people um, traveling through that intersection were reacting to the design out there. Um, so that was a really great opportunity. Um, after um, tonight, we'll be uh, going to the Planning Commission in October. And then at that point, after we've um, heard comments from the community and from you all, um, we'll be developing the draft um, and final plan through the winter. So um, just to recap the project area, uh, it starts at the Ohlone Greenway and Masonic Avenue to the west, all the way up to Tulare on, on the east side. Um, as you can see, it overlaps the border with the city of Berkeley um, along a section of it, so we've been closely coordinated with them um, throughout the process. Um, <clears throat> there's several goals for the project, and I'd say sort of overarchingly it's to bring a street that's 
was designed, you know, 60 years ago, largely for moving cars to a place that's more in 21st century design, um, really focusing on uh, safety for all users out in the corridor, but particularly for pedestrians, um, families with strollers and people in wheelchairs, um, improving transit access efficiency and reliability along the corridor as well. Um, providing a, a cohesive streetscape. A lot of the features out there are um, pretty uneven uh, and, and have uh, sort of changed over time. Um, and really to support the local businesses that are out there today. And that's been one of the most important parts of, of the conversations that we've been having is how can we support um, economic activity and vibrancy to the corridor. So we're really bringing people out and making it the, the main street that everybody wants it to be. Um, so uh, just in terms of the existing conditions out there, this is a, an example cross-section of Solano Avenue where a lot of the right-of-way between the buildings is given over to parking and cars. Um, and the experience for people crossing the street is that it's, it's a fairly long distance. Um, we know that a lot of the cross-sections are either offset or T-intersections, um, and it, it's a challenging environment to, to get across there. Um, and so uh, a lot of what we heard from the community and what we evaluated in the data um, uh, really uh, pushed us towards um, reallocating the space out there towards um, a, a richer streetscape for people to um, congregate and for better streetscape improvements um, and then to really narrow um, the cross section there so it's much more comfortable to walk across the street. This is just an example at the um, intersection where we have curb extensions. We also are recommending pedestrian refuge islands and a few spot locations as well. Just as an example of, of what the crossing distance would look like out there. Um, through the, the mid-block sex, sections of the corridor, we have um, angled parking, and so the, the travel lanes there would be 15 feet wide to accommodate people um, pulling in and out of those spaces. Um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll talk about the, the concept through the corridor in, in greater detail after the presentation, but I just wanted to share some of the big ideas that we've developed um, in collaboration with the community. So this is at Solano and Santa Fe Avenue in front of the, the U.S. Bank building. It's a, it's a pretty wide sidewalk out there right now, and if we're recommending more curb extensions along the corridor, we really want to make sure that they're programmed um, and, and places that people really want to be. We don't want to just be recommending concrete for concrete's sake. So this is just one idea of how we could really transform the bus stop area there into a place where people want to congregate and linger. And, and up on the, the top right is what it looks like there today. And I believe this bank building is also part of your general plan as um, a, a, re, you know, a place to be rezoned in the future. So great opportunity to collaborate there. We also looked at opportunities for mural and public art spaces um, along blank walls throughout the corridor. Um, <clears throat> when we were out on Saturday, we had this idea that we wa really wanted Pinterest boards or, or different ways to capture people's excitement about different ideas along the corridor. So these are just a, a few different um, sample applications of how we might um, populate the corridor um, through enhancements around the bus stop areas, uh, bringing in public art and murals, um, and then thinking creatively about how to, to bring bike racks to the corridor as well. Um, this is another example. So this is at Solano and Key Route Boulevard. That's a tricky intersection as well because it's offset and has a lot of different movements going. So what if we actually brought the Ohlone Greenway out into Solano Avenue and brought the activity down to the street there? What could that feel like? Um, and so that could be with the um, uh, current businesses that are there today. It could also be transformed into a coffee shop in the future. Um, but really about how do we bring um, that livelihood down to the corridor? Uh, again, some other ideas that we shared with the public uh, on Saturday that were, people were really receptive to were just different kinds of paving out there to um, kind of liven up the corridor. How can we think about um, new street trees and plantings that are really cohesive and appropriate for the corridor um, and di different kinds of furnishings that will bring people out. We heard a lot about the new Albany blue sign on the, on the Greenway <laughs> at this station. Um, and then finally, this is at Solano and Tacoma Avenue. So I think this is technically Berkeley. 
Um, and so uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar. It's a wide expanse of a, of a um, crossing environment out there. And um, universally, we've heard, let's do something great with this intersection. And so um, in this example, we're showing a plaza that can be um, integrated with stormwater management features and great landscaping. Um, someone uh, suggested, what if we brought the uh, the coffee kiosk that's at Flowerland and did something great like that at the plaza here. So just different ideas of how, how the corridor might look in the future. Um, these, I'd say, really captured people's attention and they're excited about what could Solano Avenue could be. Um, final, the final sort of design elements that we're looking at, including um, branding and a sense of place, feeling like you've arrived to the corridor and to the main street of, of, of Albany. Um, also looking at rain gardens and stormwater features. Um, and then finally, pedestrian scale lighting that's really appropriate and comfortable and, and right at the intersections where people are crossing at night. So I just wanted to share a few different examples or a few different photos from the pop-up demo that we had on Saturday. I don't know how, if we're any of you all out there. Okay. Great, so some of you saw it. Um, we set up on a Saturday, we wanted to pick a very busy day and it was busy, traffic was a constant stream throughout. Um, and we used uh, permeable materials and, and Flowerland lent us some plants and some um, seeding out there. Uh, and so you can see in the center here is a pedestrian refuge island and then we extended the curbs um, on, on the edges as well. Um, here's an example of what the crosswalk looked like, and we had a lot of pedestrian activity and a lot of good conversations out there about what it meant for drivers turning on and off in Pom Pomona Avenue. Um, here's just an example. We got to see some uh, fire trucks go through, AC transit buses. Um, it was really, really helpful to see just different types of vehicles out there. Um, and then this is what was happening at Flyerland. We were set up there with several tables and large roll plots, and um, people were, I'd say, just really positive in their feedback. Um, people are just ready and, and hungry to do something out there, so. Um, yeah, so just to recap, our next steps coming out of this evening, we'll be meeting with the Planning Commission and then going into the draft and final plan this winter. Um, so I wanna pause there and see if you have any questions before we dive into the concept plans. And, and, and I'll also say that we, it's sort of up to, to you all how much detail you'd like to go into tonight on, on the draft design. I think you'd be surprised how much detail we'd be willing to go into. <laughs> um, I thought you might say that. You, your presentation so far, is, uh, to me, has been very clear. And I, I'm seeing from the rest of the commission, we're ready to just keep going. All right. Great. <laughs> Would you like me to bring it up from here, the sure. design? So um, just, just so the audience knows, the, the roll plots that we had on display at Flowerland, we're going to project up here um, section by section and go over each page. And um, commissioners received a hard copy, so you can, you can follow through with that. Yeah. I have an extra hard copy here if an audience member wants it. I can pass it along. And Anne, are these already posted on the website as well? Okay, great. So if you go to Solano, um, solanocompletestreets.org, so this is available along with the um, perspective renderings that were presented and, and photos from the event on Saturday. Great. So people can download them and, and comment on those as well. Um, okay. Well, I'll say that um, the we've just started conversations with the community about the draft design uh, a week ago, and we've already gotten some really good feedback on how we can tweak it based on people's um, experience out on the corridor and some good questions as well. So, um, looking forward to, to building on that tonight. So, I'm going to start from the west, heading east, um, and the first uh, intersection we're going to be talking about um, is at Key Route Boulevard, and this is the one uh, place along the corridor where we're showing two alternatives there. Um, the first one uh, that you'll see on the first page on the left side would be to actually um, route the southbound lane um, uh, behind the memorial that, that, that's there today and connect it with the northbound lane to make a, 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 um, 
a, a true intersection there because right now it's offset. Um, that would give the opportunity of creating some more public space there and, and as we showed in the rendering um, and sort of bring the Ohlone Greenway out um, and help kind of rationalize vehicle uh, movements at the intersection there. Um, on the right side, we show um, the, the configuration as it is today, but just narrowing um, the travel lane there and um, only allowing for right in and right out on the southbound. Sorry, right out. There would be no, no right in. <laughs> um, can you clarify one thing for me about these plans in general? We see at least on the printed version, I'm not sure if we see it up there, but we see some what look like tree symbols that are not colored green that are kind of outlines with a wavy line around the edge. Is that suggesting that it's an existing tree that will be kept or an existing tree that will be removed? Yeah, that's a great question. Right now, these are just showing um, the existing trees out there. And so as a next stage or next step, we'll be working with um, the arborist in the city to identify any that would be removed. For example, like along the block face of flower land, we've heard that those trees, while beautiful, um, may not be the appropriate tree type out there. Okay, so when we see a green tree on the proposed plan, it means you're, you're proposing adding a tree when we see an, a non-colored tree, it means it's an existing tree that might be kept or might be removed. That's right. Okay. That's right. Yep. All right. I'll just keep moving along unless you all have questions, and I trust that you'll interrupt. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, so let's move on to um, the section between uh, Pomona and Carmel. Um, so this includes the area by Flowerland, China Village, a um, lot of activity here. Um, what we're uh, recommending here are curb extensions and pedestrian refuge islands at Pomona Avenue. We have a question from the audience. Is this is a clarif clarification? Yeah, process question. So it's pretty detailed. It would be possible to comment as you go through it, or do you want to go through it again? I, can I suggest that we just see if we can get through it and and have one perhaps more extended set of comments rather than to break it up? Otherwise, we'll be here quite a while. Um, Based on the generalness, I, I think that's pretty much appropriate. But we will definitely come back to the vigils as we go through, as necessary. Yeah. Maybe if there are clarifying questions, then if people want to ask them, but I would say it is a lot to absorb right now. So this is, take it as a grain of salt, this is sort of a high level overview of this. Um, <clears throat> continuing on um, eastward, um, we are cleaning up the um, angled parking because it's there, there are different widths throughout the corridor, um, also um, providing uh, more spaces for um, accessible parking. Uh, and as well as opportunities for motorcycle parking or, or bike parking that would be in the street as like a, a bike corral um, or other needs, for example, um, if there are a bike share station in the future. Um, so providing more flexible spaces here. Um, as you'll see, the, the red markings uh, along the, the parking stalls here, the idea is that um, these would be a different pavement color and it helps um, visually narrow the travel lanes there um, along the corridor. So just a, a different paving type. Um, heading further east, uh, similar treatment types at the intersections. We're recommending pedestrian refuge islands. Um, there are a lot of different iterations of a pedestrian refuge island. At its most basic form, it can just be paint, um, but doesn't provide a lot of um, uh, safety benefits necessarily for pedestrians. It can also be um, a built, built curb, um, which provides uh, more comfort. Um, these are locations where we're in conversations with emergency services and, and other folks that need to get through here to think about how we design these intersections appropriately for, for their needs. All right. Um, so now we're at the intersection of Santa Fe. This is the um, one of the um, few signalized intersections through this section of the corridor. Um, received a lot of um, feedback about how to improve this intersection here. Um, that includes uh, realigning the curb ramps uh, here, but also at pretty much every intersection along the corridor um, to make it easier for people to cross there, and also um, extending the curbs. 
the California Bank and Trust Building here. I think I miss. Uh, miss, miss said that it was a U.S. bank building before. Um, this is where uh, we're imagining a, a lot of opportunities for enhanced bus stop there um, and place making the urban design uh, elements there. Um, further east, uh, along to Curtis Street, next to the Safeway, uh, we heard a lot from folks about how this is a very busy intersection for people who want, wish to cross, also a, a desirable place for bicyclists to cross. Um, so we're recommending bulbing out the, the corner on the uh, southeast side. Um, <clears throat> the, the arrows here in front of the Safeway indicate how um, we imagine trucks would circulate in and out of the, the Safeway parking lot. And as a next step, we do need to connect with Safeway and understand um, how their proposed design might work with their circulation needs for, um, for loading. Uh, there are two driveways into the Safeway right now on Solano Avenue, and we're uh, recommending as part of this design that the uh, eastern driveway along Solano be closed uh, to reduce the number of um, uh, conflicts with pedestrians out there. Um, also gives more opportunity to widen the sidewalk um, and increase parking. Uh, at Nielsen, also you can see how uh, trucks would be circulating um, around the block um, and into the parking lot through there um, beyond the, the driveway that would be closed. Um, at Peralta, that's the designated bike route uh, for the City of Albany crossing there, and so we're um, recommending um, a, a, a green bike dash uh, treatment through the intersection as well as a rectangular rapid flashing beacon there. So that's uh, a, a, a type of light that would help pedestrians and bicyclists cross there more easily. Uh, it has the sort of lights that flash rapidly like a police car does um, and can be very effective in, in the conditions that we have out here on Solano Avenue. I'm sorry, uh, you're showing it um I'm having trouble here. That's it. The, the arrows in the bottom left, the black arrows. Uh -huh. Safeway. Yeah. That, that's intended as Safeway truck transit? Yeah, and it's just schematic for the purposes of this plan that we wouldn't be putting giant arrows out on the street. Oh, oh I understand. Yeah. Um, so not for their semis, though? Yes. But that's how their semis ah. access the property to do delivery. No, actually, it's not. <laughs> they back in from the other, yeah. So they they don't actually use. Um, I'm Neil, sorry, Nielsen. Nielsen. They don't they don't use Nielsen. They they back in from Solano from the one western driveway on on Solano. Okay. This came in up at the technical okay. advisory committee. Well, right. we we still need to okay. sit down with them to talk through it. Oh, this came up at the technical advisory committee meeting. Our Community Advisory Committee meeting as well, and what we need to sit down with, same way. Yeah, I think. I, I will say that the panel trucks often that service uh, Safeway, the, the shorter trucks, will often come in the eastern Sol Solano driveway and park in that open area where there aren't any marked spaces. So okay. there, there are trucks that use that driveway, so maybe they would end up using the, the Nielsen entrance. Okay, well that, that's helpful and I think that I expect that we'll need to tweak the design based on the conversation with them um, and that'll affect uh, what we are proposing at Curtis Street as well for that intersection, so. Um, okay. Will you slide the, to the next one? Great, okay, so. Um, oh, did we miss one? No. Oh yeah, okay, so Tacoma Avenue uh, on the, the right side there, that's um, showing um, in plan view the schematic that we showed before where it's reducing uh, the, the crossing length there and widening it out to create a plaza. Um, and then just further to the east, that's the, the, uh, the easternmost extent of the corridor to Lari um, would be a similar treatment of um, um, improving the, the crossings there um, as well as at Ventura. Um, in this current design, uh, as shown, it would Im increase the net parking by nine spaces, um, and it would also increase the number of ADA accessible spaces. Um, I can't remember exactly by how many, but we did increase it to, I think, I wanna say 
it's it nine. would be nine total ADA spaces. 15, yeah. I think it's fifteen percent of our overall on street parking capacity. Yeah. Yeah. So this was just from evening out the angles from the staff report. That's right. You mentioned okay. Yeah. And and just one other thing to note um, on this particular graphic, um, there is an AC transit stop that's proposed to be eliminated on the south side of the street. So that's where some so. additional capacity would be gained. What street is this one? This uh, this is um, Solano between Ventura and Tulare. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, at this point, I'd like to suggest that the commission ask any questions, and perhaps we could flip back to the first diagram and start there. That sounds great. Uh, does the commission have any general questions or questions based on this section of the street? One, one general question is, did you look at um, different angles of, uh, of angled parking um, to potentially widen out sidewalks, or were you being sensitive to maintaining the quantity of parking or, or increasing the quantity of parking? I, that's the trade-off I see. That's a very astute point. Um, the, this, this current draft uh, is shown, and it, and it largely is around balancing those two things, but it also um, does maximize parking. There are other options that could, for example, widen the sidewalks in front of Flower Land further, um, but that would um, decrease the number of parking spaces along a couple of those blocks. And, and so, I guess we're in like early concept. Um, so if we were, if the commission gave you instruction to look at that, how would you carry that along? Would, would there be multiple alternatives or if we were to look at, say, widening sidewalks? Yeah, um, so I, I think it's just a couple of block segments where the sidewalks are still somewhat narrow um, because we have widened them in other places. It wouldn't take very much time for us to look at the different options to um, change, for example, from parallel to angled parking um, to show what the effects of that would be. Um, and we've started the conversations with Ann and Justin about that already. So, yeah. Just to clarify your point, are you talking about different angles of angled parking or you're talking about angle to parallel? Um, I think any any varying degree in between um, if we were looking at widening sidewalks um, as a goal. So on the topic of angle parking, uh, I know we've ha had some comments about back-end angle parking. Um, and my experience has been that typically uh, has at least one issue, which is the, the rear overhang of a car. So the furnishings zone tends to be intruded into um, if we wanted to contemplate that, would we try to extend the curb out, basically narrow the street to create sort of an overhang zone? Or do you have any thoughts on what could be done to achieve that? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know that we've gotten that far along in the conversation um, because this first iteration preserves the parking as is, um, but we can certainly take a look at that and what a kind of right away we want to think about for that overhang. Okay, part of the reason I asked that we did do a back end angle you know, on a temporary basis on a street where we're doing construction in Berkeley and we had to move things like parking meters and other objects out of the way, put them on the back of the sidewalk instead of at the curb, the furnishing zone. So my hope is to avoid that since we have trees and other things that we don't want to move. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Do you have, no? Okay. Um, I have a question on the intersection of Masonic and Solano. Um, it, it looks like the, uh, the project limit is just to the west of that intersection. There's a real difference in the distance of the crosswalks to the curb bulb outs or to the edges of the bulb outs. The, the southern crosswalk remains uh, very offset from the intersection. Is that intentional? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So you're talking about this crosswalk right here. Um, I would need to confer with our design engineer about that, but I know that some of the crosswalks are set back on the side streets because of um, cars that kind of inch out into the roadway to make their turns onto Solano um, and trying to avoid conflicts between um, those cars that are like kind of basically sitting on the crosswalk there. So that might be one of those situations, but. So can you extract a little more of um, You're trying to leave space for the crosswalk behind a car that has inched forward? That's right. Okay. Yeah. So what, what's the thinking in which ones are close and which ones aren't? Yeah, that's a good question. I would need to come, I would need to talk with our design engineer in a little bit more detail um, to answer that. And I'm not sure, I mean, to be honest, I'm not sure it might be a utilities question at that specific location about why it's pulled back. Um, there is an existing curb cut on the west edge there that is located in that exact spot. Yeah. Might have just not gotten changed to the plan. Yeah. But we can certainly look at bringing that crosswalk further north, if that's kind of the second part of your question. I'm just curious what the thinking is. Yeah. I'm also interested in the concept of um, as we, I'm trying to do this without making an opinion, as we uh, add more and more uh, ADA based ramps, we have made it easier for people to do things like skateboard and ride bikes along the sidewalk. And it's certainly not legal for anybody to ride either of those things in the commercial zone. It's dangerous because doors open right onto the sidewalk. Um, is there a way to reinforce that that's not appropriate without making it less significantly less uh, attractive to walk? Yeah. Or, or uh -huh. roll your stroller. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, I think that there's probably a, a few different answers to that. One is making um, the infrastructure for, for example, people who bike much more attractive so that they're not getting on the sidewalk. Um, the skateboard question is kind of a, a, a different a different beast. Um, I'd say that. Um, the thing that, that probably deters that type of activity is a lot of people out there, street furniture, you know, kind of creating a busy street life that uh, makes it difficult to uh, move freely on a skateboard or a scooter or something like that. Um, those things can also be addressed through signage like they have in downtown Berkeley. Um, moderately successful, but I'll let Freed answer that. <laughs> um, or you can also do it through enforcement or encouragement. Um, so no single silver bullet on that answer. But I would say that on Solano Avenue, the, cur the curb ramp issue is so egregious that um, it's going to be a really good thing for everybody once that's fixed. So, Okay. Just for practical purposes, I'd like to propose that we go on to the, the next diagram, get input from the commission, and then have a period of public comment, and then do another cycle for the part I'm recused for, and then do a, a last cycle for the, the remaining two pages. Great. Did any of us have any um, comment one way or another on the, uh, the alternatives for key route? Yeah, I'd lo love your input on that. So comment-wise, yes. <laughs> but we're not you making comments. We're, we're, we're not making comments. Mm. I, I can form it as a question. Um, <laughs> Jeopardy. Because would, Jeopardy. Would, would your um, more aggressive alternative involve removing any of the trees behind the memorial? Because the trees apparently identified with individual fallen Albanians in wars. Right. Yeah, I understand that there's a lot of sensitivity around that area. Um, as it's shown, it would not touch that area, and it could be left intact in perpetuity for as long as the, the community would like it for it to be. Okay. Did that cover your... I'll save my comment. Okay, right, all right. Any other comments or questions about sheet one? So moving on to sheet two, 
questions about sheet two? Is it correct to say that most of the parking spaces that are added are, or many of the parking spaces that are added have been, are because of the elimination of a bus stop at the east end of the project? That's a good question. I think it's a combination of the, the bus stops that are being eliminated as well as um, just cleaning up the, the spacing across There's them. kind of three specific areas within the corridor. Um, so one is the bus stop elimination um, on the eastern end of the study area. Um, Safeway, if that driveway apron goes away, that's three parallel spaces that would be gained on street. And then the portion of Solano between um, Key Route and Pomona on the south side, for whatever reason, is striped at a different angle um, than the rest of the corridor. And there's, I think, at least two spaces that are picked up there by just simply reconfiguring what's, what's existing. Okay. Other questions about sheet number two? Yeah. Um this has an example of it. Um, for the bus stops, did you did you consider? Um, it, it looks like every bus stop is on a curb extension now, which is great. Um, but uh, with the curb extension, the the bus will block the lane of travel when um, stopped. Um, so, did you or do you have to make any consideration to whether or not the bus stop is on the near side or the far side of the intersection? Um, when stopping traffic behind you. I know certain cities um, and city staff are sensitive to that. Um, and maybe on Solano, we're not. Um, but when you have a far side a curb extension bus bulb, then vehicles would be queuing behind the bus in the intersection. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, right now, we haven't proposed any changes to the bus stop location. We've been sort of taking the cue from AZ Transit of where you all would like them to be, but I think that that's something we could certainly talk about in light of the, the con conceptual design. And if we need to um, tweak it in any way, given the, the, where the bus stop, you know, the ideal bus stop location is, then we can certainly do that. Are there any further questions from the commission on the first two sheets? Hearing none, I'd like to open it up to public comment on the first two sheets of the, uh, the handout. Should we take public comment on general issues that aren't and, related and to on a general particular sheet? Issues that are that are germane to the whole design. Yes. So. Um, you're welcome to come on up, please. I, I have two speaker cards oh, yeah. from Preston and from Amy. What, they're motioning. We can take it after your comment. Anyway, just three things. Come on up to the microphone so, so we can get it recorded. Yeah, sorry, my name's Tom Newton. I live in the 900 block of Santa Fe and have for 48 or nine years. Um, there's three things I want to make sure that we consider, and, and at the top of Santa Fe at Solano, uh, there are pedestrian walk-wait signs going north and south, but not east and west, and I can't tell you how many people I see just moronically stepping off the curb because they, don't, they aren't told not to. Uh, do the lights include sorry, those? Sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt you. Just a sec. If you're going to talk about that, I need to leave the room. Well, but no, no, I, Robert's going to take care of you here. Okay, oh, fine. Right. Anyway, so I just need to know that the traffic signal at that corner is going to include, it never has had walk weight going north-south. It does have it east and west, but it ought to include those. It would save a lot of people getting run over, I would think. Uh, the other thing, another thing, is the street trees that we're going to plant, it ought to be specifically noted that they're not to be liquid amber because they've ripped up sidewalks all over Albany. And I, including in front of my house twice, but we don't want to plant those anymore. We don't, they should be banned. Uh, but then that would be admitting, anyway. So, oh, and then the different pavement color I think is a good idea. I, I saw uh, the demonstration at Pomona 
on Saturday, and, and it was explained by the consultants that it would help at least make the street traffic lanes look narrower, slow people down, that's fine. But I wonder how they're going to color the asphalt. I think in a few months or a year or something, it'll look like, I'm afraid that it would look junky. You know, I mean, it'll, the paint will come up and it'll look like some bad idea from Phoenix or somewhere. Um, but so those three things, the pedestrian signals at the top of the street at Santa Fe and Solano, don't plant liquid ambers because we're all tired of paying for the sidewalk repair. And the pavement color, I mean, that was explained there were several different ways you could do that. You could put brick down there or, or the big expensive and different, uh, anyway, I guess you could use really thick paint. I don't know. The idea is a good one, but I don't want it to look like crap in two months. That's all. Thank you. Do we have anyone who has uh, other comments on Solano and Curtis or Solano and Santa Fe? Um, those are... Uh, Wait, he's back. He's back. But, so he doesn't have to keep popping in and out. So if we have any of those comments on Santa Fe or Curtis, we should take them now. No. Anyone? Well, we have actually huh? planned to take them when we're dealing with that particular sheet. Do you mind going back in and out twice? Because we already, since we already started. Come on in then. Hi, I'm Amy Smolens with Albany Strollers and Rollers. Been a part of this process throughout, so I really appreciate the chance to give input. Um, the Pomona and the um, sidewalk on the south side of Solano between Pomona and Carmel is pretty much the worst, narrowest, windiest, most user unfriendly piece on Solano Avenue, and you can't walk two by two, and I can't imagine if you're in a, in a wheelchair with a stroller, it's, it's really tough. So um, you indicated that the huge trees may or may not be taken away, depending on um, input from the arborist, but um, if you remove the median pedestrian islands, you can certainly widen the sidewalk regardless, and I think that's a place where you, you need to uh, the sidewalk needs to be widened um, in front of Flowerland in those two blocks. Um, and that's it for this section here. Next section later, thanks. Well, again, Preston Gordon speaking as an individual. Thank you very much and thank you to you. It's exciting to see this design coming forward. Um, some general comments, back and angle parking, please, please, please. Uh, you have a letter from Britt Tanner, who is a project engineer, licensed engineer that works for San Francisco. Um, the letter was from her as a resident, but she says they're putting in back and angle parking and have put in back and angle parking all over San Francisco. Uh, so please don't uh, go with the anti-backers as you will, please listen to the science and the engineering and not the non-professionals. And the science and the engineering says it's much safer. It's much more convenient. Um, it's the first part of a parallel parking maneuver, which people do all over the place. So while there's this high fear, uncertainty, and doubt factor, it is the better way. Um, as far as the trees, I, I really think the, the width of the, the clear width of the sidewalk should be maximized along here. Um, you know, it's ridiculously narrow in some places already. Flowerland was mentioned. My opinion is there should not be a bias to try to preserve the existing trees. Trees grow back. Uh, we'd be better to organize the trees to support the sidewalk life. Um, and use, and in that regard, 45 degree angle parking, whether it's back in or pull in, has a lot of wasted space behind the vehicles. And so what has been done in Fairmont um, on the north side along the BART parking lot and Pierce Street along the west side is the trees are in a tree bulb that is using that wasted space. So you get the boast of both worlds. You get trees, you get a wider sidewalk, you have less wasted space. Um, so please consider doing that, rather than keeping the trees in the in the sidewalk width. I mean, we should really have you know very grand wide sidewalks through here, I believe. Um, the median refuges again. It seems like 
biasing towards widening the sidewalks, which would be possible if the median refuges were eliminated. Um, and what the median refuges being there does is it makes for a wider street or a wider lane in between, you know, mid block or along the block, which is going to tend to increase speeds. Um, it seems like on Solana between Masonic and San Pablo, not having the median refuges, but instead having the wider sidewalks and the shorter crosswalks works out pretty well. Now the slopes are steeper here, so motorists tend to pick up more speed westbound. Um, so it's a bit of a trade-off, but I still think having the wider sidewalks might be the bigger advantage. Um, there's a number of small landscape areas. You can see them on this design at the, uh, it's okay if I keep going, this is a pretty complex design. All out. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a lot of small landscape areas proposed at the edges of the bulb outs. And you can see for walking along Solano, that is, they're set up to create very narrow access ways to the crosswalks. There's no dimensions on this plan, but I would guess that's four feet wide. That's ridiculously too narrow for the amount of uh, sidewalk users going up and down Solano. That would basically create a choke point at every block. Um, also, these landscape areas are going to be kind of a maintenance headache. I've been out with the Blue Glove crew, and these landscape areas tend to collect garbage and be a pain, in, real pain in that regard. So I'm not sure they're really serving the purpose of making the street more functional um, for sidewalk users. Obviously, keep the stormwater treatment facilities, which are a separate kind of facility from these specific landscape areas. The, the stop bars on the side streets, I mean, I think the crosswalks at Masonic uh, parallel to Solana should be brought closer into Solana because that's there's a signal there, so that should be some more standard. Um, I would say you should look in detail at where the stop bars and the crosswalks are on side streets where there isn't a signal. I know on Solana between Masonic and San Pablo, there's a problem of them being, so, being kind of in the worst position where they're far enough back that motorists have to pull forward in order to be able to get the sight line they need to pull into Solano or across Solano, but they're not far enough back that when somebody pulls forward in their motor vehicle that they're clear of the sidewalk, they're actually blocking the sidewalk. So it seems like they should either, the crosswalk should either be, you know, moved towards Solano or away from Solano, but not kind of that, that middle area. Um, um, specifically on the key route, Alternative. I don't know if you can go bring that up by any chance. Yeah, so on the alternative, um, there's a median shown on the west leg, and I'm quite concerned. You know, right now there's sort of an informal left turn situation so that people who are headed through can kind of squeak their way through. Um, you're thinking about eastbound vehicles yeah, east north onto Key Yeah, route. sorry, I apologize. I probably mixed that up. But um, yeah, so eastbound vehicles. So I'm concerned that by narrowing that and Key Route being, I think, a collector, if not a minor arterial, I'm not sure which it is in the general plan, there's not insubstantial volume of left-turning motorists there. And so when they stop to make that turn, it's so close to Masonic, it's basically going to gridlock potentially, or at least back, you know, way up down, down Solano eastbound. So I don't know if a left turn pocket there is warranted, but I, you know, something. I wouldn't eliminate the possibility for a through motorist to get by a uh, left turning motorist there. Um, and then I would suggest that there be a crosswalk in the key route alternative, that there be a crosswalk well, that there be a sidewalk and a crosswalk, so a sidewalk along the east side of that new park, and then a crosswalk to the median to the north of that, or at least provision for that in the future, because one of the elements in the active transportation plan is a walkway down the median of Key Route, and that walkway is needed, I would say. Key Route, oddly, for such a wide street, only has four foot wide sidewalks, and in Albany Strolls and Rollers census of sidewalk conditions around the city, it found that four foot wide sidewalks are quite often narrowed to less than two and a half feet wide by overgrowing vegetation. 
which is not the case with five foot sidewalks. It seems like people have a certain tolerance for how far the, the owner of the vegetation will allow the vegetation to go over the sidewalk. And, and if you have a five foot sidewalk, they don't let it go so far that it chokes it off. But four foot is too narrow, particularly given that this is a route to the high school. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you for your forbearance. Thank you for those specific comments. Please. Hi, my name is Philip Chen. I live on the 800 block of Pomona Avenue. And um, this weekend I was driving home, so I was sort of surprised to see this mock up there. But I actually got out, talked to some neighbors who one neighbor who also didn't like what was happening at the Pomona Solano um, intersection. And I actually got out and drove that intersection about 10 times in different directions. So uh, I like the, the goal, the objective here to slow down traffic on Solano and to make the crosswalk safer because that area is difficult for me to walk with my twin boys even because it's there's a lot of traffic going there. But when they put in the middle median, and then the four kind of corner bulb outs that was really tight when I tried to make a left turn from um, Pomona onto Solano. It's a tight left turn, and then the turn right onto Solano going southbound on Pomona, you also have to stick out halfway into the intersection. Well, you're, you're basically sticking out into the intersection before you can see far enough to make your turn. Um, I, I think it's too aggressive how much they pushed out the corners because the the street is basically narrowed. So when you're going around, you're going to hit. Uh, if you're doing if you're doing a left turn from Pomona onto Solano, you're probably going to hit the curb or the median a bunch of times. When I did the turn, I had to be really slow and careful. Um, the other issue I have with Pomona is that a lot of people bypass Key Route. They use Pomona as a throughway to go from Solano to the school. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a traffic survey done because we were complaining that the speeds on Pomona were excessively high. Like there would be a lot of people that would basically accelerate from one stop sign to another, and they would be driving in excess of 30 miles an hour. The survey results showed that there were excess speeders, but the excess amount that they were speeding wasn't high enough to warrant, uh, warrant any traffic slowing measures, basically. So my concern here is that if there's any congestion due to bottlenecks from basically narrowing Solano at all these intersections, um, if there's any bottleneck near Key Routes, Masonic, and Solano, will that redirect more traffic onto Pomona? And will people then be accelerating from Solano, Pomona to go to the next stop sign because they're delayed? And I'm wondering if, the, if any traffic survey has been done or any model has been done to see and quantify what the actual impact in terms of slowing down or bottlenecks. Uh, I mean, I've heard some qualitative, sorry, Quality we'll take a few more seconds to finish up. About it'll slow down but not cause bottlenecks, but I would really want to see that done in practice. Like if they do the mock up on the Saturday, do it on all the intersections. Leave it there for a few, for a few days. See what the true impact is everywhere, whether you cause bottlenecks or not. Because um, I don't want to be in a situation where there's more traffic on Pomona, people driving excessively fast. Um, I also don't want any queuing on Pomona when I'm trying to go out in the morning to try and turn left, turn right onto Solano or left, because the streets are narrowed there. If people are, if the cars start to queue and get backed up, um, then I don't want to be stuck waiting in the morning to get out of my block. Um, the other thing is, sorry, uh, this is supposed to uh, enhance, I think, cycling safety or people or cyclists, but. By pinching off the corners here and the median, especially at that Pomona Solano intersection, you can't fit a cyclist in a car at the same time. How's anybody going to make the turn with a cyclist? You can you can barely fit 
Um, I could barely, I mean, I had to go carefully with my van and I can get it through. My neighbor who has a truck said he had difficulty doing that. Somebody who I think had a, tra a trailer hitch on that Saturday or Sunday who's going through there couldn't make it through uh, the median mock up. So I think that really needs to be look at, looked at um, and some kind of uh, study in terms of congestion and then whether there's enough space for cars to turn. Um, and I would want, if this is all going to be done, another traffic survey done on Pomona to make sure what the impact is on speeds there. Because it's, right, it's, it's too fast. People bypass Key Route to go onto Pomona. And if, if you block the left turn from Key Route onto Solano now, people coming from El Cerrito that are going down Key Route aren't gonna go there. They might cut across Washington and go down Pomona. So uh, I want we heard that you look cut there. through point. Sure. You're starting to repeat. Was there anything else? No. Thank you. Hello, my name is Judy Kwan. I also live on the 800 block of Pomona, and I also was kind of surprised by the mock-up on Saturday. And I, like Phil, would uh, like the idea of slowing down, but it's pretty hard to get off of Pomona Avenue onto Solano, and I'm afraid that with the narrowing there, that I'm gonna be kind of, I'm already trying to inch out and now I have to inch out more carefully to make sure I don't hit a curb as I make a turn, either to go up Solano or down Solano. Oh, and I'm also looking at what happened when we did the work on Marin and the effect it had on the side streets. That on, you know, like that street before Jackson where people like me turn so that I can and go down without having to wait so much at the lights down near San Pablo. And I'm afraid that we might have some unintended consequences of slowing, making it a little safer on Solano and not so much safer on our side streets. And we do have a lot of foot traffic on our street. Like the, you can just see the high school students going there no, in the morning and afternoon, the parents driving their kids to school a little fast because they're late. And, and so I just would like to ask that there be some kind of study, not just a conceptual idea of how it should work, but how it actually works. If there's more mock-ups like ask, Phil's asking for or some kind of actual data that shows how will this work. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the audience? Okay, so let's bring it back to the commission for comments on the first two sheets or the whole project in general with the proviso that if it's about things near me, I will leave the room. So there are some of the questions that were brought up that maybe we can get answered by the professionals, like how is the colored asphalt created and can it be made to last a long time without degrading? Yeah, I think that's a good question and it really gets down to the materials that are chosen for the project. Um, you can have high quality materials where it will last indefinitely or in a long, for a long time, and it'll um, continue to look good. You can choose a, 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 you know, a cheaper material that would need to be replaced sooner. So, I think that's a detail that would come at a much later stage in the process, um, based on funding availabilities and priorities for the project. So, uh, Harry, did you want to ask any other questions um, that were brought up? Let me see. Now I guess the rest of my notes are for the, well, not really questions. I, I just think we have to wrestle with the, the overall priority in our mind of whether we want more sidewalk width or more um, 
more treatments in the street, such as medians and trees. All of those things are kind of competing. The medians, the trees, and the sidewalks are all competing for the available space. And I think we've heard from at least some people that they feel this design goes too much in the direction of adding medians and adding trees and would be better served by devoting more of the width to sidewalks. So I, I don't mean to be right now expressing an opinion on that, but just kind of... No, no, you, this is a time for opinions. For I, but overall, I don't know what my opinion sheets. is, so... Okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to bring that question to the forefront, so I, I'd like okay. to hear everyone's opinion on it. Um, there was a question about, um, or a concern about maintenance, and maybe that's something you can talk about. Um, looks like there's a lot of, uh, of uh, street furniture enhancements um, and landscaping, and so were there ideas about how that would be uh, maintained? Is that you know, public-private partnerships? Is that city or whoever it may be? Yeah, uh, another great question. I'd say that this, uh, at this point, it's really kind of more focused on sort of the inspirational vision for the corridor and what, could, what it could be. Um, so it's fairly unconstrained in terms of, you know, in terms of the ideas that I shared in the, in the initial presentation, like you could go all the way to the to, to one end and, and have an, an incredibly vibrant, artistic, public, you know, thriving public space, but that's going to cost money um, to install and to maintain. Uh, I imagine that um, you know it'll be a phased project that'll really need to prioritize safety and access and ADA, you know, ADA considerations um, before we can get to some of the sweet stuff. Um, but I would imagine that it would be pretty similar um, in terms of feel to Lower Solano, in terms of that balance there um, and the, the maintenance um, costs for, for that portion of, of the corridor. I guess here's another general comment that came up from some members of the public um, about the, um, at what stage is it appropriate to start indicating specific bike parking accommodations on these plans? And it's true that the plans as they are right now are very concrete, no pun intended, about where the car parking spaces are, and they're kind of vague about bike parking, and I think we might want to try to bring bring those more into parity to show to show the equal importance of yeah. those modes. We, it's hard to see it on the eight and a half by 11s, but there is uh, a few spaces uh, along the entire corridor where it's marked with an M where it could be either motorcycle parking or in-street bike corrals. Um, but we can make that more prominent, and that would be in addition to the racks that are on the sidewalks out there today. Um, and uh, we were also there thinking about flexible spaces, space opportunities like parklets and you know other uses um, for for the curbside out there that we can make more prominent in the draft plan document. Um, but there was the issue of maybe excessive landscaping at the curb ramp areas that was choking down the the pedestrian path of travel a little bit too narrow again related to the to the question of sidewalk width but but it's a slightly different issue at the intersection where there's plenty of width it's just if we put if we if we devote too much of it to landscaping it may make it hard harder for people to walk mm -hmm. those areas. And yeah, that, that was a really good comment. You know, I think that one of the things that we were trying to balance is when you go out there today, there's, there is a lot of curb, there's a lot of concrete out there, and the current landscaping is sort of mixed in terms of its performance. So we'd want to balance that in, in the future design for this as well as how can it be maintained properly, where are the sweet spots to, to plant it, and how can that serve stormwater flows. Um, so I had imagined that it would evolve quite a bit from what we're showing here um, today. Okay. Um, do you want to comment about the positioning of the stop bars on side streets? 
Yeah, I, that is sort of what we were talking about at the very beginning about how do you, you know, one of the things that I think that I, I feel personally as a resident and people also spoke to is that it's hard to cross Solano, not just as a pedestrian, but also for drivers um, and that you're inching out and inching out and trying to make those turning movements or just trying to get across on a dog leg and it's quite challenging. So we did consider that in the in the positioning of the crosswalks and swap bars, but we can take another look again if, if there's opportunities to further um, address that. I mean, that that's an issue that we face in Berkeley and a lot of the neighboring communities is how. Um, but the, but I think one of the the added benefits is you know really sl slowing down the traffic along Solano Avenue is going to make it easier for people to be getting out across the streets there as well. Mm -hmm. What did you think about Preston's observation that if you can put the crosswalk close to the main street and then cars can kind of pull across and out and complete their turn all in one movement, or you can put the crosswalk set back from the main street, cars can get across the crosswalk and then wait where they're not blocking it and then complete their movement. But if you put the crosswalk in that intermediate position, they're pulling out and waiting, and at the same time that they're waiting, they're also blocking the crosswalk. Is that? Yeah, so crosswalk placement, you know, there's a lot of different dynamics at play. I think the, the, um, the primary goal is around safety and visibility for turning motorists and through motorists to be seen pedestrians. So that's um, the crosswalk placement as we have it now is really with that in mind. Um, but I think that Ramona is a good example of this where um, we're showing a curb extension where the idea is that there would be a little bit of space for the car to get beyond the crosswalk as it's turning, turning there. So, um, but we can take another look at that to just think about how we can stagger those, um, those different competing needs there. Okay. And I think we've heard from a few different people that maybe the combinations of medians and bulb outs are on the aggressive side in this plan. Um, again, I'm not sure what my opinion is, but I wanted to mention that we also heard from, from Britt, who's uh, the professional um, traffic planner for San Francisco who was mentioned before, and she addressed this, she expressed the same concern that, that maybe we've made the lanes a little bit too narrow for emergency vehicles and some of the curb bulb outs, curb radii are too, perhaps too aggressive. Um, so I, I, think we've, I think we've now heard that, that concern from at least three different people. I just wanted to put that out there. And again, it, I don't think there's anything wrong with showing that in the preliminary plan and kind of establishing that this is the kind of thing we're looking for and then maybe stepping back from it a bit as we go into more detail. If I can beg forbearance, you were, um, I, I saw an article uh, recently about uh, some treatments that they're using in New York, um, where instead of having a refuge, they actually use fairly flat bumps that are painted in alternating colors. And they're about, I don't know, 10 or 12 inches wide. They probably come up three or four inches. And they're using them just like the the, for example, on Ramona, there's a elongated bulb out away from the crosswalk towards the intersection to sort of get cars or drivers to align their, their cars and be ready to face and deal with the, uh, the crosswalk and the conflict area. Um, that would take up a lot less width. Wouldn't be as comfortable for, as a refuge, but might have a similar effect for, uh, <coughs> for having a better interaction at that conflict point. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a great point and that there's a lot of different materials and tools you can use for these various applications and they can even be sort of a, a short or rapid implementation opportunity, especially around pedestrian safety in the corridor. Um, got a lot also kind of ties into um, the plans for funding this project overall and what are some of the short-term kind of low-hanging opportunities just to improve the experience out there in the near term. So. Um, yeah, absolutely. The refuges could be mountable. Um, they could be, you know, kind of tailored, but depending on the, the intersection needs there. Um, 
And that's also true for curb extensions. You might have seen them in New York as well. They're doing them now in Los Angeles where, and, and in San Francisco where you can um, extend the curb with um, different kind of bollards and treatments. Flexible bollards, yeah. yeah. exactly. So. Fareed? Thank you. Um, so a possible evaluation filter to think about for the distance of the crosswalks from the intersection, how far they're set back, uh, kind of came to mind when I was thinking about one of the uh, pedestrian crashes that occurred at Masonic and Solano, um, which is the closer we bring in, the crosswalks in and the stop bars in, the shorter the distance between the stop bar and the crosswalk at the far side. So the likely potential speed by the time a vehicle reaches that crosswalk is lower so the severity of a potential crash ought to be proportionally lower. Um, just lower speed crash means less chance of injury. Um, so that's, from a pedestrian safety perspective, an argument that we could make why it would be a good idea to pull those crosswalks in close to the corner. Um, the, the vehicle sight line question is certainly one that's compelling. I agree that a lot of places on Solano you really can't see what's around the corner until you, you're in the crosswalk. Um, and it'd be nice to have people be able to see before they pull out and block the crosswalk. Um, so that's a thought, especially at the, the Masonic intersection. It feels like we could really tighten that up and it might sort of change the perception of this isn't a huge intersection. I feel a little more confined without actually changing the physical dimensions of the intersection. So that was a thought. Uh, with regards to the key route intersection, I like the alternative because it provides for those southbound left turns, uh, less chance of diverting traffic to a parallel street or just you know, losing uh, circulation opportunities. So I think that's actually a pretty nice approach to take and I like it. Um, with respect to the, the bus bulbs, near side, far side, um, when you've got a single lane and a bus bulb, the nice thing is traffic is stopped behind it so you don't have the, the risk to pedestrians. Also, with the near side bus bulb, you avoid gridlocking the intersection with the cars stacking up behind the bus because now the intersection is clear in front of the bus. So I think that could work really well for us here. Um, in terms of street decoration, pavers or brick crosswalks would be kind of cool and some of us who remember them would find them a little bit nostalgic, uh, but also easier to maintain than paint. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that's... Uh, Last longer than the nostalgic ones? <laughs> I, the ones that were torn out because it was concerned that they might be an ADA problem? Among other things. I, I, I remember a lot of sort of brick uh, well, crosswalks that didn't last. You know, we, we, need, we need better quality. You could use stamped concrete so then there's not individual bricks to fall out. Um, you could do the crosswalk, you do the whole intersection. Depends what you're trying to achieve. Um, and. and I think stamped concrete introduces a lot of opportunity for decorative treatments that are very durable. So just a thought. Um, back in parking um, avoids one of the risks of nose in parking mixed with crosswalks, which is backing out across a crosswalk and not seeing a pedestrian, which up at Solano and Fresno. There's at least one fatality that happened years ago there from a car backing out and knocking a pedestrian into the other lane of traffic. So it's not totally hypothetical. It's something to consider. If we keep the front end parking, uh, we might want to look at the places where the, the back out maneuver does cross the crosswalk and maybe make those the ADA spaces so the loading area moves the parking space further. Or motorcycle or, or bicycle. Motorcycle. Yeah, exactly. Those, and, and that actually we did do that. Yeah. So that, that has been addressed. But I tried to find yeah. ones that looked risky and it actually didn't okay. see much. So a good job right. there. Well, let, um, let me know if there's any that we should take a second look at. Uh, it was just something that occurred to me that you know, is always worth looking at. Uh, with regards to the wider sidewalk instead of the refuge islands, uh, given that we need space for cars to back out or nose out or you know, back in, that's where we need the, the width. So the, the ability to have the median or the pedestrian refuge um, is just using the, the extra space in the 
maneuvering lane width. So I don't see that we could widen the crosswalk for the whole, or the, the sidewalk for the whole length of the block. That's my understanding. That, that's, that's correct. So I, I would tend to think of it as a, a choice between do we have the refuge or do we pull the bulb outs even closer in um, that question of can bikes get through. I know we had an issue with that on Santa Fe that the commission had to deal with uh, some time ago. Santa Fe and Ramona or Santa Fe Pomona, whichever one, one of those. Not two. near my house. Not by your house. Yeah. Way, way south. You're, you're clear. It was yeah. near my house. <laughs> <laughs> it's not before the commission at this time. Okay. <laughs> but the, the point being that the, 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 the choke down at the intersections, you know, when you've got bikes and pedestrians, it's certainly worth giving some thought to. And it's either you get people to share the lane or you leave enough width that they can squeeze through together. The treatments uh, of whether we go rolled curb so that a car that does clip the island doesn't you know, get damaged. Um, some people will say, oh, well, that's not providing pedestrian safety, but a vertical curb that's six inches high does nothing. A car that hits it at speed will go right over it, may cause damage to the car, but still go over the curb. So um, I, I, my perception is that those refuges are largely a visual deterrent. So whatever treatment we use that maybe doesn't impact emergency vehicle access or you know, large vehicles that maybe kind of climb it uh, because they can't otherwise make the mm -hmm. maneuver. Uh, anyway, th those, that's my laundry list of comments. <laughs> Great comment. Thank you. I actually have a couple of more things. Did you want to add? Uh, you can go. I have okay. comments. Um, so there were, Preston brought up two issues at the intersection of Key Route that I wanted to drill into a little bit. One the simple one is the idea of a pedestrian connection to the median of Key Route Boulevard. Here. Yeah, is that easy to add? So, so from the westbound crosswalk, straight straight shot up through that around along the edge of that park, and then yeah, I think, the, the I think the full comment was to add a, a sidewalk. Yeah, that's the straight shot I was thinking, yeah. Okay, and the other was concern that the the median that's shown there will cause queuing because of eastbound traffic trying to turn north onto Key Route and blocking the through traffic. Uh, yeah, we can take it, I don't know if we have, do we have turning volumes for that intersection? If we don't, if we do, that's something that we can take a closer look at. And if we don't, we can talk about getting them. Yeah, I, I do think it's a, it's a likely um, traffic pattern because at least from where I'm coming from, if I'm trying to get to El Cerrito, Key Route actually turns into one of the major streets in El Cerrito. It's more of an arterial. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to enter Key Route south of Solano because then it's hard to get across Solano. So right. personally, I tend to take Masonic, then take that short block along Solano and go left onto Key Route, and that's kind of the what I consider my through route, <laughs> my arterial closest to an arterial route to that part of El Cerrito. Great. Um, and finally, I do want to make a plug for the back in angled parking, and I, we've we've kind of talked around the issue here, but I think it's a really important um, idea to consider, and I'd be disappointed if we didn't make a serious effort to include it in this plan because it really is a a rare opportunity to to make parking a whole lot safer. And for me personally, when I use my car on Solano Ave, that experience of backing out of a parking space is terrifying. I don't know about anybody else, but I, I can't imagine why we even let people do that. You just don't have any idea what you're backing into, a bicycle, a car, a, a skateboard. A, you, just, you just go slowly and hope for the best. It's, it seems crazy to me that 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 any society would, would ever permit such a thing. But we're used to it and we just think that's normal and that somehow backing in is too hard for people. But I think if the back end parking were designed properly and, and had enough like landmarks for people to look at as they're backing in, it's just a lot safer. So I, I would really encourage us to to consider that as our primary improvement that we can make in all of this. 
Yeah, I second that with the back end parking. Um, I think the challenges I've seen with back end parking in other cities is uh, the uh, um, parking attendants um, can't monitor the, the, the parking, but we have free parking. So I think we're okay here in, in Albany. So um, there's lots of advantages to the back end parking that I'd like to um, to explore. And I don't know if there's a way that we can we can test that out in uh, in any of the, the, the blocks that we have um, before we uh, take a full dive, but that's a good way to to at least see if it's um, something that will work for us. Um, along the lines of the angle parking, um, I would like to look at the trade-offs of uh, how do you get wider sidewalks um, compared to the angle of the parking. Also, I think I heard the median refuges, um, if, there's, if there's a need for those, um, and it's a trade-off getting wide, wider sidewalks for that, um, as well as the street trees. Um, and then in terms of the, the, the bus stops, um, the easiest place to put the bus stops is where they are now. I mean, I, under, I understand that. Um, but there is an opportunity to optimize the bus stop locations. Um, you know, one of the things that AC Transit is looking at is, is how, can it, how can it speed up its buses to maintain its reliability and schedules. And one of those ways is, is thinning out bus stops um, and having people uh, walk further distances. So maybe there's an opportunity here of thinning out bus stops um, possibly opening up the, those spaces for, for other uses, uh, whether it be parking or, or larger bulbs or whatever it may be, um, um, which would also uh, uh, speed up the, the transit service. Um, but you have to go through a, a, a fairly difficult or sensitive exercise of moving bus stops um, adjacent to properties where people may not want the bus stop and may not want the extra activity. Um, but I think it is, uh, worth looking at at least on paper and seeing what um, what can be done about optimizing the bus stop locations. And I think I agree with Fareed that near side bus bulbs um, on Solano, we have examples of it already, and it works. Um, so we should follow that same um, that same approach. Um, tied to that sort of is the is the street furniture. Um, I think we have to take a pretty good look at at what the city is willing to take on. Um, both on liability of street furniture, maintenance of street furniture. Um, we, we have the uh, bus stop parklet, and that's really successful. So that's a way that the city um, relieves some of its uh, uh, maintenance obligations by partnering with adjacent businesses. So I'm hoping that whatever design is out there, that it can provide that blank canvas, whether it's at bus stops or other locations, to allow for um, parklets, bus stop parklets, um, et cetera. Um, AC Transit is coming out with a bus stop parklet design guideline. I think the draft is completed at this point, so it's just waiting to get to the board of directors for approval. And once that's out there, probably in the next few months, then it can be adopted or used by, by cities. So. We need to pay attention to our time. Yes. I have that in mind. Was that about it yes. for you? Okay, so um, I need a motion to continue the meeting. I'll move to continue for half an hour. Second. I have a second from Robert. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Mr. Chair, just to do a, a moment of agenda management, um, Please. I think um, it would be good if possible to get to item 6.3, which is have you um, make a recommendation regarding the ballot measure. Um, item 6.4 and 5 can either be, um, 6.4 we can put, put off to another meeting, and 5 is informational, and 6 is an administrative matter that we can deal with off outside of the scope of a meeting. So um, I don't know if anyone's here to talk about bus shelters, but maybe if you wanted to make a decision now not to talk about bus shelters, someone. Well, is there anybody here to talk about bus shelters? Hearing none? OK. Um, I, I think uh, we can handle 6-3 fairly expeditiously. So I'd like to press on. And we have a, a motion that has carried, I didn't hear any nays, um, to extend the meeting. Um, but should we announce now that we are not going to cover 6-4, 6-5, and 6-6 during the remainder of this meeting? Thank you for picking up on staff's cues. <laughs> what he said. <laughs> so that was 6, 4, 5, and 6. We're going to skip for this meeting. Sorry if you were here for that. Um, and we will pick those up later. Um, 
and with the continuation of the meeting, it comes back, I think, to me for my comments on, on this portion. Thank you for your patience. Um, I, I heard a lot of good things. I'm not going to do a lot of repetition uh, besides, of course, back in ankle parking. Um, you know, we, we th this commission had long intended to try and demo back in ankle parking at a location in Albany. It was later, and that was in our active transportation plan, is in our active transportation plan. And it turned out that that particular block along mo the Memorial Park on Portland has too high a crown to really efficiently test that out. It would be uncomfortable and, and uh, would add to difficulties. So um, in the time that I've been on this commission, we've been looking for another place to demo uh, back in Angle Parking. And th there would be no more prominent place than Solano Avenue. Um, and I am in favor of giving it a fair trial. I have used back in angle parking uh, in places like uh, Salt Lake City. Um, back in angle parking is, at, for my cycle training, when you control the lane, you have a lot more uh, opportunity to do things. Like when you're driving down the road, you put on your turn signal, you control when you stop, and then back in to the back in angle parking. Um, you don't have the same opportunity when you're trying to back out blind. Um, I've, I've heard various objections to back in angle parking, including um, it's hard to see where you're backing up, which to me is actually an argument for back in angle parking in a way. Um, certainly many cars today have backup cameras um, I happen to think that most of those are really good for seeing directly behind your car and not so great for seeing out to the edges. You also can't control the length of the car next to you. But if you're back in angle parking, your car is now pointed straight back. You can see where the curb is. So, I, And there's a new law, and I forget which year, but all new cars are going to have backup cameras. Um, I would really like to see a trial of back in angle parking in Albany, and um, I hear a lot of support for back in angle parking on the commission here and from the audience. And um, so, staff, we would love to see a proposal to test back in angle parking. If option, sorry, it's getting late, optimally as part of this project. If that's absolutely not possible, then soon thereafter somewhere else. Let us brainstorm how to, how to respond to your comments tonight. Thank you. Okay. We'll figure something out. Okay. Moving on. Thank you. Um, as a cyclist on Solano Avenue, I always take the lane westbound, downhill. I don't want to be close to the cars that are, I'm sorry, backing out. <laughs> um, and I can maintain speed with traffic. Sure, I'm pedaling pretty fast for me, but I can use the exercise, and I, it's, it's, it's optimal for me to be in the lane downhill. I cannot maintain that speed westbound, so I do a combination, I'm sorry, eastbound. I do a combination of lane sharing and taking the lane. With the way this project is laid out, you're gonna take away the lane sharing that cyclists probably mostly do uh, eastbound which is going to back up traffic behind a cyclist who chooses to use Solano. Solano is not my first choice during the day, um, but for the last block or so of somewhere I'm going, I'm usually on it. So I'm, I'm worried about a narrow lane uh, eastbound on Solano and the implications for that. I would also be interested in uh, Sharrows westbound on Solano to reinforce that cyclists have the right to take the lane legally. I've had some interesting discussions with motorists, both brief and extended. You can imagine. So please take that into consideration. I, I would, I, if, if we put in medians, we're giving up a lot of space that is currently in use. Um, along with that, um, 
neighborhoods that I'm exposed to on Solano uh, have a lot of uh, nighttime activity. Very little nighttime enforcement. The, the meter maids, the, the, the parking attendants have gone home. Um, they're not timing how long people are parked. Um, people tend to park in the red zones. Uh, they tend to double park on the street to unload or to pick up and drop off. We're increasing, as a society, the number of pickups and drop-offs because of ride hailing and, and other things. Um, I would love for the plan to anticipate that. I don't see that in, in the current plan. It, it's not. That would be a, like a programmatic recommendation that will be included in the plan about how curbside activity would be managed with the things you said in mind. So that has definitely been on the minds of staff, and um, we've been continuing to evolve that conversation based on current and future activity that we expect out in the corridor. Can I interpret your answer correctly to mean that we should expect to see more of that in the next iteration? Yeah. It, it may not be shown on the conceptual plan. It would be more like a narrative section of the actual plan report. Hmm. I would request to see it on at least one block of the conceptual plan. Sure. Okay. Because if it's not in the picture, I don't expect to see it in the final product. Maybe that's being cynical, but that's generally why I've seen things go. Um, I would add to street furniture the uh, possibility of USB charging stations, maybe a solar tower, maybe a, a hardened bench with, with plugs, you know, whatever might work. Um, we seem to have too few opportunities on Solano for the sort of the teen, to teen and later generation other than food during high school lunch. Um, it'd be great to draw more of those kids at other times. And I think those are the end of my general comments. Um, at this point, I would like to uh, have the commission address the uh, sheet number three with your questions and uh, then public comment and comments. I'm going to step out of the room. Sure. Why don't you let me know when I should Yep. Do we have any public comments for Sheet number three, which is uh, the intersections of San Carlos, Santa Fe, and Curtis. See none. Preston, do you have any comments on Santa Fe or Curtis or San Carlos? See, I thought that was a great point, the lack of a pedestrian signal indication on Santa Fe. Um, and Curtis, um, there's a possibility of it becoming a relaxed bike route or part of the Blacks network in Albany. That's really something I favor because I think in the current A2P, Peralta is shown as a relaxed route north, south, and east Albany, but there's sort of a realization, one, it's got the much greater slopes, it has higher speeds, higher volumes of motorists. Um, so Curtis, particularly now because it has the rectangular rapid flashing beacon at Marin, seems like an opportunity to actually have a calmer street that could become a bike, relaxed bike route or bike boulevard. So in that regard, it could get some kind of a treatment that's similar to what's proposed at Peralta, um, skip striping or something else, although I believe it's more offset even than Peralta, so I'm not sure what treatment would go there. And I think Amy has some comments about the, the proposed crossing of Peralta that are relevant. Hi. <laughs> also, at the meeting last week, Beth Thomas mentioned that Curtis was going to be a, a bicycle boulevard in Berkeley. So if we had treatments, then that would match up with theirs, which would be nice. So, um, yeah, the Peralta skip strike thing kind of looks like it slams you into the... If you want, you could yeah. wait till Ken comes back yeah. to talk about oh, Peralta. Oh, okay. All right, um, then I'll wait. Okay. Yes, next Anything else on uh, these intersections? Turn it to the commission for comments on 
this page? Nothing additional. Well, I'd like to hear from you about. Um, you know what? Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, the California Bank and Trust, that kind of parklet type treatment is really nice, and you guys probably know that Albany Strolls and Rollers has. Um, funded a bunch of bike racks and pumps, and there's actually one of each of those there, and we would move those, you know, those could be incorporated into the new design, and if you wanted more or any other parklet or, or public space type, um, you know, type treatment that you're doing along, along, the, along Solano, you know, just talk to us, and we'd like to be involved in helping, you know, provide some of those amenities like a pump or a rack, right? Uh, regarding Santa Fe, has anyone considered changing it to a four-way stop? I don't really know what the implications of that would be. But. Um, I will say that I, I think based on my recollection of the collision data that that um, does have a collision history there and that a signalized intersection is the best treatment for that kind of situation. So I, we, we had not heard um, from anybody in the community or based on our analysis of, of replacing the signal with another kind of stop control there. Okay. Um, what about the idea of a walk signal on the east-west legs? To, uh, to upgrade them so that there's yeah. uh, a, a pedestrian this, head? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yep. I would add that if, uh, I think the plan assumes that the technology would be upgraded and be a new system put in there sometime very soon, it's pretty old. And it wouldn't, as a normal part of doing that, we'd do a, an analysis of the, the volumes and movements and so forth just to make sure we're putting in the right configuration. Okay. And is it feasible to add the, the bicycle crossing uh, markings on Curtis similar to the ones you've shown on Peralta with skip striping? Yeah, we can take a look at that intersection. And I think that um, we also received some good feedback um, at the advisory meeting last week just about how um, if there's a, a closure of a driveway for the Safeway parking lot access, how that might affect um, the Curtis intersection um, and truck movements there. So I think that that's just a location that we'll want to take a closer look at um, for pedestrian and bike access and safety. One thing I didn't mention when I was presenting it is that um, we're also recommending a rapid flashing beacon on the west leg of the intersection of Curtis as well. Um, so that would be another place where there would be um, a, a, an activated beacon there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, was there any thought to putting the crosswalk um, farther east so that it would go like straight from the southeast corner to the northwest corner? Yeah, and in that intermediate. Yeah, that was, that, that was actually an idea that came up in our meeting last Friday, so we can also take mm -hmm. a look at that. And the, the reason that it's not, you know, on the east leg right now is because of the driveway entrance. Um, right, you can't put it all the way on the east leg, yeah. but in the middle position is another possibility. To yeah, look at. yeah, so I think the next time you see this, it'll be, there'll, well, there'll be some iteration to this intersection. Okay. Can I go get Ken? Are there any other? Oh, uh, yeah, quickly on um, the uh, bus stop in front of Safeway. I think that one doesn't have a couplet bus stop in the opposite direction. So that's an, op that's an opportunity for optimizing or putting in a bus stop um, or just looking at the spacing um, between Santa Fe and whatever's, I think, up the hills Peralta probably. So is that wide enough? And can the one in front of Safeway be removed? That's a great attractor. So that's the trade off there. Um, but it is odd that it doesn't have a, a paired stop across the street. Mm -hmm. the, so the bus stops that we're showing right now have, have, were in consultation with AC Transit staff, but I don't think that, they, that the um, staff that are on the advisory committee have had a chance to weigh in on this as well yet, so that would be a, a good next step. Okay. Yeah. All right, yeah, I'll bring them in. Should I keep us moving to the next page as Ken comes in? 
It would be the intersections of Nielsen, Peralta, and Tacoma. I thought I'd keep them going. Thank you. Right. So we're on, uh, moving on to sheets four and five. Yeah. I have a question. Please. Um, for Peralta. The, the note says that there's a curb cut to facilitate bicycle through movement. I'm not 100% clear on what the intent of that is, that the bike would ride up onto the sidewalk? This is, for, this is input from our Portland and Seattle design engineers, <laughs> where, they, where they've installed it there. So we're putting it out there just to get your reaction. Uh, essentially, it would be um, these little sections here would not be like part of the sidewalk. Um, the idea is that they're sort of staging areas for bicyclists to, to, to um, travel through the intersection. They say they work very well there. Whether they're the right application for this intersection remains to be seen. So. Okay. So are they colored green as like as a continuation of the skip striping to show that? Yeah, the, I mean the skip striping. I mean you can color them green for sure, but that's that's how it's aligned right now. Right. But certainly. I mean I I think it it could be a good treatment, but the way it looks right now, it doesn't. I think it doesn't express the intent right. very well. But I think if the recognize that I think if the coloring were done right, then and it was clear that the intention is this is the route you follow on your bike, then I think it might work okay. well. That's good feedback. We'll be more expressive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. I guess I'm curious as to how they help a cyclist. For me, the hardest part is getting across the street, across Solano, and it looks like they're to help you get around the corner. I think the idea is that it shortens the crossing yeah, distance. Yeah, you stop further out there. So it lets you do your crossing at more of a perpendicular so you're not in the roadway for as long when you're crossing? So you can make a more direct movement. That's right. I mean, I think, I think that it's considered a, a lower stress movement. So if you were like a child on a bike, for example, you could just get kind of snap across and then, and, and then turn with the, okay. the edge of the sidewalk there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I Obviously, think, I need to vacation with my bike in Portland or Seattle. Right. <laughs> well, I think that um, with this one, we should also include some um, photographs as, as examples of what the application looks like, because I think it's hard to conceptualize it here. So, yeah. Other questions? How about on the next sheet? Let's just do the two together. There's a lot of parking at this end. Yeah. It's also a low parking demand area. It's just how it seems to have worked out. Well, this is the area where there's actually new parking that's proposed because the bus stop is, is going to go away. Right. I'm, I'm just saying we know from a recent parking survey mm -hmm. that it's a, it's a low, lower demand area. Questions? Oh, it's just interesting because anytime I've tried to park there, it's been hard to find parking. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Just well, my anecdote, which is not all times. So. Yeah. I guess the other thing to think about too is that hopefully this is a design that lasts for many decades, and you know how the how the activity evolves over the corridor over that time remains to be seen. So. Is it also true that? that east of that line, it switches to metered parking? That's correct. So a lot of the people parking there may be people who just didn't want to pay the meter. Like even if, yeah. if there aren't as many businesses right there, but the people who are using the upper Solano businesses may choose to park in the free Albany parking spaces. That's a good point. I wonder if the Albany and Berkeley uh, parking control officers ever sort of meet and joust as they turn their U-turns in the middle of the street. I'm sorry, it's getting late. Um, are, are there any public comments on this section? Sure. Yeah, those green skip striping lines that kind of look like they're going into the sidewalk through me, and I, I just don't think they're 
needed or practical that I just think most people are just going to go angle diagonal into the to the next uh, you know across the street. So I think it maybe is just something that maybe they need in Seattle because it's really crowded and busy and there's trains or light rail or something like that or but I don't know. I just think here it may not be used, but it'd be nice to see one live. Um, well, just a general con comment that I was going to make, but Commissioner Chomsky made it already that there was no specific um, bike rack locations at all, and I guess there are the little M's thrown in there somewhere, but I think, you know, as a complete streets, we do need to, need to mark bike spaces, bike parking spaces as carefully as we mark car parking spaces um, because everyone's always talking about parking spaces, but parking spaces are parking spaces. So, um, you know, if we're making Solano more bike friendly to ride on, to ride for people, um, we want to make it so they can actually have a place to park when they get to that destination. And so if they know they're riding and they notice the destination, they can just turn off, they smell some good food, they can turn off and have a place to park and eat at that little cafe or something. So it's just important to do that um, as well. And I appreciate the fact that you guys, since you're not only the Traffic and Safety Commission, you're the Active Transportation Advisory Committee or Commission for our city that you're really looking out for all those users, so thank you. Um, I also just want to know, in the next iteration, by the time you get to uh, planning and zoning, if there'll be any changes or if the planning and zoning will be the same as this we, paperwork. We anticipate taking the same presentation this evening to planning and zoning. Um, they have actually not seen this in the same way that the Traffic and Safety Commission has, so they'll be looking at it with a fresh set of eyes. So there's no point in one of us coming and saying the exact same comments because you guys have heard it and Unless question. you have comments that, that deal more in land use um, as opposed to right-of-way management, okay. um, you know, that, that's really going to be okay. their purview when they look at All this. Right. Okay, thanks. But if you want to join us, you're welcome to. Show up and talk about back in angle parking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's bring it back to the commission. And um, Fried, I don't think you've started. Do you want to start? I don't have any. You don't have? Okay. Comments. We're good. Okay. Uh, one comment on if we remove the bus stops, maybe we should think about using that space for something else other than more parking. Is there another better use of public space for that? Right, Corral? There you go. That's a lot of parking. Yeah. I think the fact that it's a lower demand area Might as well. it means yeah. there's not, <laughs> we, we, we're taking away the bus stop. We don't care about adding parking. It's sort of a no man's land. So it's, I think the, the places that people want to be are always going to be the places where we're struggling to balance competing needs. And one of the things you could do if that is, in fact, a low demand area is, um, Put some longer term parking there. So most of Solano's 90 minutes, maybe mm -hmm. you bump that one up to some two hour, three hour parking, maybe. You know. What about Just, EV parking? Sure. If, if the suggestion was made uh, EV parking yeah. from the floor. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Certainly uh, for parking demand management, you know, we, we often use pricing, but time limits can be a useful thing too. Which is what we have in, in Albany, time limits. Exactly. Yeah, that's what we can play with. Or is this a location where we, um, if you take out the bus stops, then you can change the angle of the parking to um, maintain the same number of spaces and widen the sidewalk for, for this block on each side? Lots this, of this is frustrating. I actually have information about this issue, but. Um, let me just say this. Um, there is only a bus stop next to Safeway, which is outside of the zone around my house. Um, and um, that could be because planners thought that people wouldn't want to lug their groceries uphill to the next bus station. The, the lore I got from Catherine Vo at AC Transit oh, was that um, back when that store was built, Safeway said, we want a bus stop, and AC Sorry. Transit said, okay. 
<laughs> I don't doubt that happened. Yeah. But it is, I mean, I'm sure you've all observed this. You can stand at that bus stop and look west and see the bus stop at Santa Fe and Solana, which kind of, in my mind, begs a qu question of efficiency within the route if you can stand at one and see. see right. The space right, right. Let's just say that a number of shopping carts end up on the other side of the street, down the street, at a location that is unnamed. <laughs> Moving right along, any other comments? Harry, no. I. I uh, Mr. I'm sorry. Are we, we're on comments, right? Um, I want to second the the concern about um, landscaping and maintenance, um, in particular on Ramona, on the south side of Solano. Um, the CVS building there is is somewhat recently redeveloped, and there are a couple of pits in the bulb out. And I would hate to see more opportunities for that. And I don't know how you avoid that. Um, so I'd love to hear how we can avoid that in the future. Is that a question I, for me now? I, if you have an answer. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I think that there's probably a couple, couple of pieces to that. Um, one is uh, making sure that the, the kind of the landscaping and stormwater elements um, have the right types of plantings in them and are set up well for um, kind of the, the maintenance needs that we understand there to be today. Um, I think the other piece of it is that we can take a cue from Lower Solano and how the street trees and placement um, is working there. Um, to continue some of that design further up the corridor. And that, that is something is that we want to make sure that the, this design communicates with the one in Lower Solano, but hopefully improves upon it in, in some ways as well. Um, and so I, I think that's a, a couple of pieces of it. And then the other one is I, I, it's really up to the city, um, sort of the level of maintenance investment that, that you know, should be made um, along the section of the corridor based on and kind of the, the future desire out there. And, you know, I think that it's, it's a long stretch of corridor. Um, and like I mentioned before, there's a lot of concrete out there today and there's a lot of sad pits along the way. Um, and maybe it's about focusing investments in certain areas that really communicate with the local businesses um, and trying to, to place investments in the places that really matter. Not to say that there's parts of the corridor that don't matter, but um, just being thoughtful and wise about that. Or, or maybe where there are signs that they'll be supported. Yeah, yeah. There are businesses along Solano that support the plants in front of them. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm um, sorry, it, it's reached um, almost 1030. Can I have a, a movement for another 15 minutes? Move 15 more minutes. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Please continue. Uh, one other thing I was going to say is that there's been a lot of really good conversation and questions around the PD, uh, pedestrian refuges. And, and part of the genesis behind including them in this draft design was um, sort of a, an urban design decision um, around how much do we just want a corridor that's filled with these really thick curb extensions, or do we want to try to um, break that up a little bit, um, knowing that there's cost implications and also just what do you do with all that landscape um, or real estate on those corners? Um, and so that's that was one of the reasons that we thought to kind of break it up with the pedestrian refuges would, would still keep the crossing distances narrow there, but wouldn't require the curbs to be extended as far. Also thinking about the bicyclists um, kind of getting through there. So um, just, just one data point there for, for the intersection designs. Great. Thank you for having this conversation with us tonight and getting into the details and listening. And thank you, staff, for moving this program forward. It's great to see. And um, we'll, at this point, I'm going to say let's move along. So we're going to uh, move on to 6.3 as our last uh, discussion and action item for the evening.
I think that microphone isn't active. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, staff wanted to give you an, uh, a briefing on the impact of the uh, Proposition 6, which is on the November ballot, and how it would impact the City of Albany. Robert, is, is 15 minutes a reasonable time for this? We'll think? get through it in 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, as you may already know, the, the Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017 is popularly known as SB, 20, uh, SB 1, and Prop 6 would uh, propose to repeal part of that. So the purpose of the, of the measure two years ago was to enable cities and counties to address significant ma maintenance issues, rehabilitation safety issues. Um, for cities in particular, it was for local streets and road systems. Um, it also funded highway bridges. It also funded pedestrian safety programs, uh, regional transit systems. AC Transit a bit, is a big uh, benefactor as well as BART. So I'll go through some of those numbers. Uh, Prop 6 would prohibit the legislation uh, going forward from imposing any tax on the sale of gasoline or diesel fuel. So this doesn't just affect SB1, but it also give, hinders uh, legislative action uh, uh, f going forward. Um, and it's an, it has an effective date as of January 1, 2017, specifically to um, uh, remove that, r remove SB1 from the books. So it would, it would take away SB1 funding and it would affect legislative process going forward, specifically on the gasoline tax. Can I just ask a quick question? We wouldn't have to give money back, right? That is the first question on any of the workshops you go to on this question. So um, uh, gasoline uh, revenues have been taken in by the treasurer's office. They've been distributed to cities. That money um, is in the books and it's not being retroactively asked for back, so no take backs. Um, you're welcome. Um, so in terms of uh, regional and local projects, Alameda County cities have received already over $60 million. Um, Alameda County itself uh, for unincorporated areas, $42 million. Uh, $250 million for congestion corridors and relief management, I believe that's primarily Caltrans. $100 million for active transportation programs, um, outside of all the other local streets, local streets and roads uh, programs, and 750 million for mass transit. I mentioned BART and AC Transit. Um, other local bus systems are also included in that. Um, and Albany specifically in 2017 received $106,000 um, in 2018 and going forward for the life of the project we're anticipating somewhere around the order of 300 to $315,000. Um, this year we spent that on um, Evelyn Avenue. We had one block of Evelyn Avenue that we identified, so that's complete, it's in service. It was um, nearly 17,000 square feet of, man of, uh, of pavement. It was in poor shape, there was a lot of dig outs, there was a lot of base repair that had to be done. There was a buried curb, um, which we discovered, had it been essentially overlaid, um, which nobody had any plans for, we didn't know what it was there, so essentially a gutter that uh, was revealed, we had to rip that out, so a um, little buried treasure there. Um, next project um, that's already in design is Washington Avenue between uh, San Pablo and Key Route, that's 62,000. Amy, you left the room too early. <laughs> She's watching at home. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, 62,000 square feet, so that's a, that's a big, chunky project that's already in design. We're hoping to get that out the door um, fairly quickly and in, into the construction phase. Um, looking at the city's CIP, really I'm here because I can just pull out the, draw, the numbers for the CIP, the easiest. Um, so SB1 in that the, the last, the CIP has a little bit of a bump in the first years, um, and then it kind of levels out in terms of uh, street rehab funding. So long-term, SB1 is essentially 25% of, um, of our basket of funds that we use for street re rehabilitation. Um, gas tax revenue, other than SB1 funding, um, is used for street maintenance on the operating side. Um, but you can see we've got Measure F, Measure B, um, vehicle reg, reg fees on here. So we have uh, a good um, assortment of funds, and SB1 is going to be one of those that we, we rely on. We already do. 
Um, this is a snapshot of the capital improvement program. Um, I could leave this up for a bit, but essentially the third line from the bottom is SB1. Um, we have 106,000, which I mentioned, 300,000. These were estimates that I included in the CIP before we actually got the res revenue. Um, so they're a little bit low, but essentially $300,000 a year is what we have programmed out. Um, when we update the CIP, we can bring that up to whatever, 315, whatever the, the, the projections are based on tax revenues coming in. Um, the last three years, 2020, 2021, and 2022, we see that the SB1 contribution kind of levels out between 23 and 27 percent. So that's averaging out to about 25 percent. Um, in the early years, we only got 100,000, 100, so it was uh, rather low compared to that. Um, there's some unspent funds in Measure F, I believe. We're spending those on the front end. So, uh, for example, uh, Washington Boulevard. And then it levels out from there. Um, so looking at this in terms of pav pavement condition, we had our consultant, Nichols Engineering, run a couple analyses for us, one with SB1 removed and one with SB1 in place. Um, so over a 10-year period, we see about a four or five point PCI condition index change. Um, what this means essentially is that Taking away SB1, our long-term funding uh, outlook looks like about $900,000 rather than $1.2 million. So $900,000 gets us the, the, the lower line on that graph, which essentially is uh, stability. So we stay in the essentially poor condition that the Albany streets are in today. Um, and we're kind of spending $900,000 to maintain that. Um, with SB1, we have a modest increase. Um, we are in a regular conversation with uh, this commission and with council about looking for additional funding and thinking about how we can um, raise this into a, a, a additional funds so that we can we can improve the conditions into the good range rather than into the poor rather than staying in the poor range. Um, so we do rely on SB1 to essentially maintain where we are. Um, this is a miles treated number. Um, this is an NCE analysis. I'm going to skip this because I'm, I think there might be some data integrity issues here. Um, and we'll jump right to the recommendation. And this is from, this is also on your agenda, um, that the commission recommend to council um, to take a position in opposition to Prop 6. Do I hear a motion? I would move that the Commission recommend that council take a position opposite, opposing Prop 6. I'll second. Any discussion? Yes. I just want to say that the, any argument that, you know, repealing SB1 because people are paying too much gas tax is, is really kind of ridiculous. The gas tax has primarily been flat since early 1990s. Um, driving in general is one of the most subsidized daily activities any of us has. Um, and the gas tax is a user fee that isn't even keeping up with pavement condition maintenance, let alone all the secondary adverse impacts on our environment, on our health. Um, it's frankly offensive to say that we can't even pay the fee to maintain the facility we're using. Here, here. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> We're getting there, Jeff. <laughs> okay. Um, so item number seven is uh, the commissioner's chance to request future agenda items. No discussion or public comment will be taken on these items. So upcoming items that we have in the queue in the coming months include the school district coming back with the curb management portion of the plan that they said that they would come back on, um, a Central Avenue discussion for project that we discussed a little bit earlier, still working on when they're ready to present 
the, that concept here. Um, the bus stop parklet proposal on Solano and uh, a broader discussion on city pavement conditions. Um, you brought, uh, sorry, Justin, you brought the, the comment from the uh, city council meeting um, about the irregular stop signs on key route. Um, is anybody interested in pursuing that? What was the issue? That cars on key route. Motors? Oh, oh, when you're making the left turn, do you have to stop again? Making a left turn, right. making a second stop at right. the edge of the median before now. proceeding through the turn. One intersection has that treatment, the remaining ones do yeah. not. I, I don't know that if you want to talk about that, you're certainly welcome to. We don't need you to talk about that in order to put in the right signs. Ah, okay. So what would your solution be if we don't? We can't talk about it. Um, no, I'm sorry. We, well, we haven't researched it yet. We'll, okay. uh, we, we, we just take it right out of the book. Okay. In UTCD. If, if a change is proposed, I'd like to have a discussion about it. Uh, so I think we're directing staff to present us with an idea of what a change might be at some if future time. If staff decides not to make a change, then we could just drop it and not worry about it. But if there is a change, I'd like to talk about it, just to be clear. That works for me. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Okay. Um, Oh, you're thinking we, of we got some things about the hawk. The um, hawk, yeah. Yeah, that's that's what I was looking at my notes about. Um, I I would like to explore either either have staff pursue improvements in the the signage and and the hawk or or bring that up here at uh, traffic and safety, one or the other, or both. <laughs> so, let's talk about that offline. With that, um, I note that our next meeting is on October 25th. Do we, do we have to continue uh, 6-4 and 6-5 for future meetings? I think I already did. You did already? Yeah. I think we're good on that. It's not a voting thing. Okay. Um, and uh, we will be setting the November-December meeting offline. Thank you all very much for uh, sticking with us and uh, sticking with it. And uh, it's a pleasure to... Uh, have a meeting with you all. See you next time. <laughs>